Hi guys, Sound Engraver here, and with me is Professor Geek talking about deconstruction. Yay! And um, really the bigger picture of deconstruction with the, the different departments in art and also popular art, as we are seeing in current uh, mythology and also with our heroes that we have so beloved, so, so beloved the last four decades. So how are you, Professor? I'm good. I'm good. I, uh, I'm not used to talking about deconstruction, so this is going to be a little new to me, but uh, we'll see oh, what I can wing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I think this will be a, a good awesome <clears throat> deal for sure. <laughs> um, okay, so I, I can hear me. Um, Chad, if you want to just give us give us a thumbs up on audio, um, see if every everyone is good. So before we start, before we start you know, asking questions and talking, um, let's go ahead and and welcome the chat. And I, I do have to post Troy. He he was first. <laughs> oh, and uh, thumbnail credit to to the prof. He he provided that thumbnail for me. So I was very grateful because I realized I haven't done superhero images. So I needed a hand there. So thank you, prof. <laughs> I think it has my signature kind of all over it. So yeah, yeah, I think so. Even with the, the, the <laughs> uh, font. Yeah. And Melissa Harris, welcome. And Paladin Demo, I will only post one of your comments. And I, I, this is this isn't to me. This is a this is for the prop. I know. Hi, Paladin. <laughs> and um, also, I haven't seen you before, Retro Ace, but welcome. And I'm sure all of this is also for the prop. Just just what it looks like. And the net Netters Network, welcome six. Now, was that six thumbs up or six to enter? Because uh, I saw six thumbs up uh, when when you had said that. So thanks for the thumbs up. Just continue doing that if you guys would, if you haven't already. And and I don't. My thumbs up are totally organic. <laughs> <laughs> and Owen Lister. And okay, so I've seen this character around, but I don't know how to pronounce the name. Can can you give me a hand there, Prof? I always say Sertorian Clegane. I think that's the accepted pronunciation, and he's yet to correct us, so oh, I good. think that'll work. Yeah. Welcome, Sertorian. I think well. Sertorian. There you go. <laughs> that works. <laughs> and Logan, welcome. We'll be able to watch tonight, but we'll watch the video later. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> you have you have a good night, and looking forward to seeing you again. And Doctor Y, and Sabaton. I think is that how you say it. <laughs> I, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and Daniel Craig. And uh, sounds like he had a pretty eventful fourth. And of course, Big Al, our beloved Big Al. Big Al. Yes. I hope you guys, I hope you are doing well, Big Al. And My spirit animal. That's right. Well, I thought he already has a spirit animal. Yeah, he cheated on me and picked some, some girl YouTuber or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Who, who has a thing for science and mm -hmm. yes, <laughs> meteorologist Katie is what we're talking about. Uh, Agent Boomer, thank you. Welcome. Welcome. And I think that's it. I think I'm caught up with chat. So let's go ahead and get started. So just kind of um, as, as, you know, looking back the previous couple of weeks, I had done uh, deconstruction in music, in particular, the history of Western music, 20th century music, and a couple of weeks on some uh, what I what I would call overviews because I had barely scratched the surface of that kind of music history. Um, but pulling from those overviews, those two overviews, uh, elements of deconstruction that that is found in music, whether that might be melody or use of harmony or form or structure or even the performance setting and and the philosophies by, behind that. Uh, but whether you would agree with all I had said previously, or, or if that's up for debate, uh, that is for a debate another time, because I really do want to focus on heroes and mythos and really what has become of these very important things in our culture, in our society. So I'll, I'll let you take the reins on this one, Prof. Would you like to go into the mythos immediately with iconic superheroes, of course, Superman, uh, of course, one of my favorites is Luke Skywalker. Um, or would you like to talk about your own experience as, as you may have seen with my um, previous streams, my experience in the academics um, with, with how um, academics were treating music of the 20th century. 
did mm -hmm. you want to expand on that in literature and in the English department at, with your experience as a student, but also as a professor as well? Yeah, I, I think I could probably tie that to the heroes and uh, the mythologies that we have today, because, you, you know, you're, you did a great exposition of, of kind of Western culture when it came to music and everything like that. And we see the same thing happening in Western culture in stories and in literature and certainly in ac academics. And when I look at the comics nowadays or the movies and how they've treated heroes and whatnot, I, I kind of I can trace it back to how how people are being taught to write, whether that's in proper actual writing classes, you know, writing degree programs or uh, just the culture and kind of what's privileged in stories and whatnot. And it's it's true that you, you think about a story where you've got your, uh, you know, your your two dimensional square jawed always does everything right hero you know flying in at the moment to save the uh, to to save the must uh, the the damsel in distress from the mustache twirling villain you know that kind of thing there's still something powerful about that story that's that's it's archetypal it's it's there's something that we need in our psychology about that story but it's understandable that you can't those are the only types of stories you can tell with superman or with luke skywalker or whatever you know these are the only ones and comic after comic should be nothing but that of course you can go deeper. Of course you can round out characters and whatnot, but there are lines you don't cross either. And I think that people are being taught how to write good stories. I, I saw this in my MFA program, which was a wonderful MFA program. I can't say a single word against Spalding University. I, I, I can say plenty against JM, JMU's English program that I was in first, but, uh, but no, Spalding University was great and they really welcomed all different genres and, and that was great too. But I do think there needs to be just across the board if you're going to write stories, you need to learn how to write not just the craft of the type of genre that you want to write, but within the tropes, within the archetypes, within the way people read the genres you're trying to write. Um, I hope that makes sense. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, like I would see, I, I did um, with my uh, MFA, we had to do a, a big research project that was on the craft of writing. So obviously you focused a lot on the creative, but you had to do a, uh, research project on the craft of writing too. And in, in my, I focused on how to write heroes, how to write uh, an iconic aspirational hero. This is what I'm just kind of delving into those terms and, and developing that, that that's still three dimensional. That's still, you know, um, still, a, still a, a character arc still goes on a journey, still changes in the end. And there are a number of ways to do it. Uh, one way, for example, is to not necessarily tell the story from that character's perspective, but to tell it from, others perspectives seeing the character and one great version of that is uh, Superman for all seasons maybe some people in the chat have read that with Jeff Loeb it's just it's one of my favorite Superman stories ever and in, in literally it's called Superman for all seasons and each it's divided into four chapters for each season and in each chapter you also have it narrated by a different person in Superman's life so it starts out with Pa Kent as, as Clark is going off to Metropolis to, to you know find his place at the Daily Planet and such I think the second one is written by Lois Lane is she's starting to fall for Superman. And then this you know, new guy, Clark, and this nerdy guy showing up and stuff like that. And then uh, that's the, um, was it? I think that was the, I forget that you know, blanking on which seasons were correlating with the narrators, but then you have one written by Lex Luthor. So a very different, you know, um, perspective. And then finally you have one written by Lana Lang, who was his childhood, you know, friend, girlfriend, depending on the mythos, but she was, uh, it was all about him coming back to his roots after Luthor had kind of pulled some stuff on him and made him doubt himself. Even he actually had Superman in an iconic Superman story, doubt himself a little bit, not doubt that there was a right thing to do mm -hmm. and that he should always do the right thing. But Luthor pulled this kind of stunt on him to make him think that something bad happened was actually his fault and stuff like that. So he goes back home to regroup a little bit. And that was okay. It didn't cross the line. It, it took him right up to it, but it didn't cross the line. And he was able to draw that source from his home, from Smallville, from the wonderful family support. He either goes to talk to his pastor, which is a wonderful scene you'd never see in a, in a comic book today, you know, and, um, and then Lana as his childhood friend, grounding him again so that he can go back to Metropolis, go back to Lois, go back to heroism and stuff. So that was just a great example. You can do it, but I don't think people are being taught how to. That That's a good point because I think it, G going back to art in general with your example, I think deconstruction actually has a place in, in art and history. I think it's just not being taught how to do it and why to do it. Whereas what we're seeing with deconstruction, maybe this isn't true with the uh, popular uh, examples with, you know, with Superman or, or Luke Skywalker. Um, we're not seeing how to, to approach it while still respecting what has come before. This has been a running theme on my channel 
where I think it's 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 in my understanding the more i i think back in my in my college days and and as a student looking at these different concerts and uh, seeing these sentiments expressed among faculty and composers and residents they, they always said well you don't you don't like the new art you don't like the new music because you don't understand it and i think that could be the case with some people's reaction well maybe i don't like it because i don't understand it but i also think um i think it's a reaction of wait 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 okay do this but don't don't uh, berate what's come before. Don't mm-hmm. don't don't dishonor classic uh, sonata form or or you know Beethoven idea or Brahms idea. It's not that we don't like the new. It's not that we don't like experimentation. I think um, you know um, being progressive is actually expanding on what has come before. Um, but I think deconstruction, and of course you see it in examples now, uh, mm-hmm. popular culture it's just been abused. It's, it's not yeah. handled well. Uh, there's, there's, there's no function other than really what I see is kind of disdain for what has come mm-hmm. before and, and disdain for what people love. There's this disdain for this, this, whether it's story or a, a, a good symphony piece or a, a good novel, a classic novel, there's this disdain for what is seen as beautiful or, or worthy or like a masterpiece. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I, I think that's a good way of putting it, a disdain for it. And I think it it leads to the deconstruction being an end within itself. And decon- that's not what deconstruction is for. You know, as you said, deconstruction should be used from time to time, but it's a uh, it's a tool. It's a tool to get somewhere or to get to a new understanding or to do something new with a, a medium. It's not just an end in itself. It, it doesn't make you smart that you deconstructed something or, or innovative that you just deconstructed something. And I... It, there's examples from stories, but immediately I think of art and I don't, pardon me, I don't have all the, maybe somebody in the chat will know the names of the, some of these art pieces because my, uh, my art was just going to survey, my art history was survey course, you know, undergrad, but the, uh, when the Dada movement came and then we it led to just all the expressionism, expressionism was cool, but then we led to the more the abstract, abstract expressionism. But it, within that stuff, we saw a lot of that degradation, that, that uh, deconstruction for the sake of deconstruction. So they would take, um, Somebody took an somebody took an actual painting. Somehow they they uh, it wasn't just a print of a classic painting. They uh, I think they somehow purchased the the actual physical painting, like an old religious painting of like uh you know the Virgin and Child or something like that, and uh, defaced it and then put that up in a museum as art because look at what I did. Wasn't that so amazing what I did? You know and that. Just you, you can make a statement, but a statement doesn't make art. You know, uh, you can have something um, to say, but if you don't have any craft behind it, if all that craft right. was in it was just to tear something apart, well, there's no your craft isn't there. anybody anybody could have done that, and that doesn't make it art. Um, so, so deconstruction can be used as a tool. However, uh, an example from stories is a lot of times you'll see in the comics, they will take old characters from like the pulp days. Uh, Sandman, I think the original Sandman was it was an old pulp hero or at least an old classic comics hero wasn't wasn't a really in-depth or three-dimensional character if I'm remembering correctly I might be mis- mixing him up with some others but there are a lot of examples out there like this you know was kind of more of that two-dimensional sort of hero come saves the day or, or pulpy noir or whatever you know it was just sort of light on the surface stories and then you'll see comics take some of those characters once a company gets the rights and they'll recycle them and they'll make them a little bit more in depth and they'll actually draw out a backstory and we've got an arc and that is a way of that's that's a deconstruction. That's taking a something that existed and picking it apart enough to put it back together in a more complex way that might be interesting. And that's the part that deconstructionists today don't do. They skip that part. They just do the deconstruction. We don't put anything back together right. to say anything new. I uh, yeah. I mean, not not that I would condone really a, a, a deconstruction. Well, maybe maybe use deconstruction in the Star Wars universe that that isn't so iconic. <laughs> <laughs> or, or or something something of like a of a paradox of, of some some kind. But you're you're absolutely right. To take an original painting and, and to deface it, uh, it would if if there was craft behind it as as vile as the subject could be, if there was craft and skill behind it, then then that would be up for debate. But that's that's kind of where we are with deconstruction. And so there is, I, I would say there's this almost ubiquitous reaction against deconstruction because of mm-hmm. how it's been handled and, and, and how often the frequency, I, I mean, we're seeing it. Um, I'm, uh, you know, man, I'm, I was just thinking about before coming on, I was thinking I'm holding my breath for He-Man. Like they, they just need <laughs> to leave He-Man alone. I know. Skywalker's <laughs> just enough. Like don't, 
don't mess with Hamian, please. Yes. So, but please. we're kind of we're kind of <laughs> waiting for it with this kind of grim anticipation as well mm -hmm. because it, it's such a a pattern that's been firmly cemented in in with these writers and these producers that we see in in Hollywood. So that's that's good. Oh, go ahead. Well, if I could just bounce off of that for a second, another thing we see. And we're seeing this in the movies and in, uh, in the television is that uh, since some of the deconstructions are falling flat, they're trying to bring back some of the versions that stand up and hold up on their own, the more iconic versions as a way to kind of violate, I mean, vi violate, validate by association, the new, um, the new deconstructed version. So DC is constantly trying to do that. Let's bring back Kevin Conroy and, you know, the, the iconic voice of Batman in the animated series and make him a live action Batman in our new series. And well, yeah, he's going to be a Batman that murdered a bunch of people. And he kind of bows before Batwoman, who's our new hero. But but that's OK, because the fact that he's there, that va yeah. fans are hiding that in, um, and in the news, you know, currently news about, oh, well, Michael Keaton's going to return. He's going to return. He's going to return to be in the orbit of, you know, the current DC, whatever, Flash or Heroes or whatever. And it's just it's it's abusing our our um. It's misusing those iconic versions just to hope that, well, if people will go to see that or they'll think because that's there. See, they're all just different versions. No, none of, no one is more valid than another. They're all just different. But we are just as, uh, as uh, valid in our interpretation of the character as anybody's ever been. And that's just right. not the case. History's already showing that. I, I would also say, too, with bringing back the, this old cast that's beloved or, or a, a, an idea that's beloved, I think – whether intentionally or not intentionally, I think they're trying to also stop something that is happening. And that's that, that need to preserve, mm -hmm. you know, that's that uh, we, there is a, I think there is even in just inside this community that we have here on YouTube, I think there's this um, almost cultural push and reaction. Hey, well, okay. You've done this to our heroes. You've done this to our stories and our popular art. Well, we will preserve what, what, what we did have. And maybe, you know, bringing Keaton in back is, is, is a way to kind of, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of obliterate this line. The, 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 mm -hmm. Because we, we still want to keep that line. I mean, wh wherever you are on the debate, it's in my position to, I'm not bemoaning the sequel trilogy because I just don't count it as the Skywalker saga. It's just, it's just not a part of my, my view of Star Wars. Luke Skywalker is, Luke Skywalker is iconic the way he is from episodes one through six. And, and exactly. that's, and that's the line that's, and, and <clears throat> I'm not going to do anything or think in any way that will obliterate that line. And I'm not going to look at the sixth episode and say, Oh, look, look at what he's going to become. No, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to enjoy those old, you know, the original trilogy because yeah. that's, that, that was the finish to his story, that, that mm -hmm. epic story. Yeah. And the test is going to be, what do new generation, how, what, what's going to be experienced in the choice that new generations make with that who don't have the experience of the, the original trilogy like you and I have, you know, first before all that came. Mm -hmm. So that's the, um, and this is what I see with Superman. You see it with Luke Skywalker too now that uh, the people who don't are they're younger or they're just coming to these characters or they just decided to discover them now that the companies are currently pushing these new versions. It's uh, what is that's their first interpret our first experience of the character. And they, they can come away with this idea of, Oh, well, I guess, I guess that character can just be anything. And they don't go all the way to discovering of uh, the more iconic versions that'll mean something and resonate with them because of culture, society, psychology, and so forth. Well, and, and I want to uh, even add on to that, uh, you know, and, and, and chat is, if you guys disagree with me on this, that that's fine. But I did post on um, the professor geek, Facebook page uh, a while back that, you know, for all the talk or whether it's rumors or, or whatever it is, for all the talk of, uh, you know, retconning or rewriting the sequel trilogy, um, I, I actually do think that if any change were to be made, which I highly doubt, it, I, I don't think it's going to happen. But if, if it were to happen, that also is an example of deconstruction. And, and I think it's a very, very dangerous one. No matter how much you dis you may dislike the sequel trilogy, retconning it or replacing it actually is not a good thing. You have to accept what it is as what I accept it. And feel free to disagree with me if you guys like the sequel trilogy. Um, I accept it as a failure. I, I accept it as a huge, huge misstep. But it needs to be there for, for what it is. Because if we replace it, we have any motive and and by then we'd be within any reason to replace all the good things as well so let's let's not 
give them, well, I mean, this is just coming from my place and my heart. Let's not give them that, that idea that they, they can do even that. Just, I, I, I see it as a failure. I don't care for it, mm-hmm. but try not to replace it either. <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think that would cause a lot of other problems, cultural problems yeah. too, probably with entertainment and art. I, I think it would also cement their authority to be the ones who are giving us Star Wars. You know, we yes. would say, we know we, we don't accept that. Give us something else now. When would you do already have, you know, this little thing called the expanded universe has been going right. on for a while and, and they, they cut off, they stopped that because that was well accepted. didn't have their current, you know? So yeah, we, we kind of privilege or give them the solid authority. Yes, we will. We, you are the one who gives us Star Wars. You are the one who says what it is. Thank you for finally, you know, listening that we don't want this now give us something else. What if the next thing they gives us, they give us, which in all likelihood with the current way people write and the way the industry goes, will still be completely utterly flawed and still not be there. It doesn't matter. It's just it's so hard to get a good popular version of a character written or produced today from from the the, the industry. I do think we need to turn away from the industry mm-hmm. and find our hero stories and classic tales for sure, but also original tales, people writing their own stuff and then um and then and then maybe expanding these things like the expanded universe, you know, book series or whatnot, non-traditional or non major mass popular you know versions like hitting the theater maybe the uh everything that's going on in the world today you know keeping people away from theaters and stuff like that maybe that'll steer it towards that i don't know who who knows um now of course you know people listening to you all the time that they, they know uh, your take um what your channel is all about but i it's it's worth asking you know in 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 terms of the de- elements of deconstruction approach as an approach in 20th century music, like melody and, and, and structure and performance, what have been the main things, whether examples in classic literature or getting into maybe 20th century lit- literature, if that's if if you've had experience in that, or just also in, in your beloved uh, comic book stories, what have been the main things that, that those good things that have been deconstructed, and dare I say attacked, I think, I, I think I'm well, within reason to say say that word that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think in well in literature in classic literature, classic art, that's not so much uh, it's not so much a series. It's not uh, you know something you keep coming back to. It's an actual novel or something like that. You do see a progression you know throughout the 20th century going into more modernism and uh, mm-hmm. you know mo- our, our postmodernism is actually what I'm trying to say. Postmodernist uh, where let's throw out narrative structure. Let's let's we don't need that. We don't need uh, you know look look how inventive and you might raise an eyebrow, but does anybody actually enjoy reading that? <laughs> you know, where it's it's so hard to get to. And it, you, I've read books where they uh, say you can read any chapter you want first, go in whatever order you want, and they, some of that can be fun. Some of that can maybe expand what you can do with the story just a little, but but they take it way too far. So <laughs> I see that in terms of popular fiction, though. I think the problem is, and I think this has to do with the industry wanting to milk every little cent they can out of it, is that we see this uh, this serialized ver- form of storytelling, which is not there's no there's no view of the end in sight. So whether right. it's a television show or a series of movies, there's no map, there's no plan, there's just a cool concept, and then every episode is just written to the next cliffhanger. If we can just get them back for the next episode, yeah. then we can get the ratings and oh, and then the next one we'll get the next cliffhanger and the next one we get. And Big Al, close your ears, just close your ears for a second. <laughs> but this was the problem with the Battlestar Galactica remake. Oh, there's that again. <laughs> for all of the cool stuff in it, and it had some cool stuff, some really cool ideas. The premise was really cool, and that that was actually a version of um, and I don't think it was deconstructing in any kind of negative way, but it took a classic series. And it gave it a little bit more intricacies to the foundation of it, you know, and to the idea of these Cylons and their what's their mythology and their religion. That was kind of cool. That was really neat. But you can tell by the end of it, and I think even Big Al agrees with me, or, or people who uh, who uh, dearly love the show for some reason or had a great experience with it, most most of them will even tell you that if they feel che- cheated in the end. It was like the ball was dropped, um, you know, because they didn't have an end in sight. The focus was just riding to that next cliffhanger. And that's one thing if you're writing a short story, but you know, as a writer, if you're going to write a novel, maybe you're an outliner first, maybe you're not, but you still have to have some general end in mind. And then right. as, a, as a novel writer, you have the chance to go back and make sure it is all flowing towards that uh, thematically and character arc wise and stuff. I, but, you know, you know I, I, it kind of touches on your point on deconstruction being the end of something because that's the, that's the only end they can think of. 
you know, yeah. the, where, where nihilism is a, is a very easy way to end something or close something. Uh, and but on on the other hand, on the flip side, is there is kind of that. I don't know if you get it. I get the impression people have a fear, uh, or at least a sense of trepidation of of, of closure. People just don't. Mm. It, it's like it's like oh, I don't want the ending. And I, I think I think endings are good. Mm-hmm. I don't. I, I don't. Some some stories just don't need expanding on. And of course, you have you have also those shows that have a huge cliffhanger at the end of season three. So you want more seasons, obviously, because there's there's more story to tell. But mm-hmm. then then where where things are just you know it's it's like a piece of thread that just keeps getting thinner and and unraveling. Like okay, yes, we like these characters. Yes, we we've loved this from the beginning. We love this world, but can we close this story and maybe explore <laughs> another part of this world or this you know universe? And mm-hmm. and I think I think that's it might be that I'm not sure, but I think well, we're kind of afraid of closure. We don't want to end things out. Um, you know, it, come on, like Lord of the Rings, the the, the films. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a kind of a heart-wrenching <laughs> ending, but it is still yeah, yeah. and it needed yeah. to be an ending, you know? <laughs> exactly, but, yeah. But it's like, well, well, let's actually deconstruct everything so it doesn't hurt so much to end it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I think you're, I think you're onto something there. And I think it, I think you're absolutely right. People can't say goodbye to the characters. I think that it comes from a, or at least one of the things it comes from is a misunderstanding that if, if that company, if that, if that producer, if that publisher, if this, uh, whatever, if they stop telling us those stories or if they end the current story, the current narrative narrative that they're on, then we have no more of those characters. And that's never been the case with mythology. That's not how mythology works. You think about, you know, ancient Greek mythology, they had, the myth that was told that was sung around the fires of, of Heracles or, or, or Achilles or whatever, you had the, the beginning, middle and end of their story. You, you, you knew how they died. You knew how they ended up. And yet people were constantly telling new Heracles stories. Mm. Well, this is what happened. Or here's the story that I'm going to sing to you that happened when he was, um, you know, this age or before his 12 labors or whatever. The fact that you had a, a closure to a character's life or to a story's life or whatever actually made it a richer pool to draw from when, you know, when you were uh, just, whether you're telling new stories or whether you're reinventing them or whatever, because then you have that, uh, that um, pedagogical function of the epic hero that, that Joseph Campbell talks about, which is to teach you how to respond to life's struggles at every stage of life. So the young man struggles and we have, uh, Luke is a young man. We have Superboy stories and whatnot. And then you have them a little older, Luke in the EU and Superman throughout the comics to the point where they're married and they're having children. Now they're parents. Now they're, now they're, now they're older facing death, you know, give us right. a hero who faces death and don't be afraid to do that because just because that, that arc ended or that, uh, that character eventually dies doesn't mean that you don't have any more time with the character or that no more stories could possibly be told in the future at different places in his life or something right. if that makes sense oh absolutely i mean because i, I kind of feel like it'll, it'll be you don't want the characters washed up you know <laughs> at, at, exactly. that, that's also the risk i actually did want to touch a little bit on chat you know before we go on because i think sure sure we'll have a lot of questions um okay so important question is what does your shirt say let me back up <laughs> it's, my, it's my other star wars shirt um and I feel like I am being a rebel. I, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking against status quo. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're talking about deconstruction because you know I, I feel like a lot of people have a hard time with people calling out deconstruction and mm-hmm. and, and all of that. But uh, I, I'm fine with that. So, so that yeah, this is my. I think um, this is not a sequel trilogy shirt. I did buy it. I think 2016 because it was a Target <laughs> gift card. <laughs> um, it was, uh, I think it was Rogue One. I think that was the, the merchandise at the time. So, and I, you know, as far as some plot holes and, and different things like that, I, I kind of enjoyed Rogue One. Really haven't. It wasn't a horrible it. film. What? You said it wasn't a horrible film. Yeah. No, I mean, I think, yeah. I think some, there were some things in the writing, but I generally liked it. Um, all right. And I do see that Wolf 10 Media is in the house and Steve Cruz, Stephen Cruz. Oh, he's Steven saying Cruz. hi to big cow. <laughs> hi, Stephen Cruz. All right, let's <clears throat> questions. And actually, as I look for questions, um, did you have anything else to add on to that? To? Oh, I don't know, between <laughs> academics. Well, maybe like, 
have you experienced more or less the same as as a student, even as a younger student, uh, as, as you have with a professor in terms of sentiments about the craft? And yeah. What not? Yeah, the craft. Uh, Again, I, I went to a really good university for 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 writing. You know, Spalding University is really amazing, and and they didn't. So I didn't face a lot of the general sentiment. You know, in the books you'd read or the lessons you know you'd give about don't uh, you know make sure you're really. I mean, there's a great quote I say a lot, or uh, Vladimir Nabokov's quote about your the writer's job is to get their main character up a tree and then throw rocks at them, <laughs> and, and meaning yeah. that you know. You can't just have a story about Mr. Happy with his Mr. Happy life and his Mr. Happy day. You know, they, there has to be problems and complications. And, and right. of course, but people take that far too, far too far. And well, you needed, you needed to make them more flawed. They needed to be more, do they? Not everybody's as horrible as your world perception might make them out <laughs> to be. You know? um, but then in, uh, I'm sorry, if you have questions or if they've no, you know, no. chats or anything, stop me. But uh, in terms of studying literature, though, I did face this a lot in the English program, specifically, there was a science fiction class I took. Mm -hmm. And I loved being able to read the books we, we covered in there. And I loved a lot of the writings we did about them were interesting. But a lot of it was just so let's squeeze this book in every piece of uh, scholarship that might have been done on it. Let's squeeze it into one of the agendas or another. And, and we read great works. We read Dune. We read Foundation. We read Neuromancer, you know, and we studied them on that level. And they were wonderful to, to read and experience. And the professor wasn't too too uh entrenched but you get you got the the uh the opinion still came out you know that the the, the uh, fellow students who had been trained and at that point to to must see this in a book you know or something like that so that's amazing and, and actually we'll get to a question soon i i saw i saw age boomer say something about luke skywalker so i have to address that um <laughs> with science that that's so weird with science fiction because science fiction based on its art and craft alone can talk about very heady, very psychological, uh, economical, geographical, you know, all, all those things uh, that mm -hmm. you know, using natural science, hard science, also social science, science, science fiction can do that without the agenda because it, it in, in, in past decades, in the past century, it's, it's just done so well as a craft. In fact, I, that's why I like science fiction so much because it, through story and craft, it, it can actually touch on a lot of um, particular hard, hard things, hard things to chew on. And uh, I don't know why, like contemporary fiction, I get, you know, yeah, throw some <laughs> agenda in there, but science fiction, I mean, they, they were already doing that. <laughs> mm -hmm. So let's see what aged boomer has to say. Sound engraver. I think something that people forget about Luke Skywalker is that even though the Empire is responsible for murdering his aunt and uncle, he doesn't join <clears throat> the rebellion out of revenge. Exactly. He he joins it for a noble cause. Now he has that naivete and that spirit of adventure in him. But I think I think the death of Obi Wan also, for as short as that relationship was, I think it it was a turning point for him. He he didn't leave the cause. He developed a, a friendship with of course, Princess Leia, and mm -hmm. and he still had friends from the Academy that he saw uh, at the Yavin base. So he had he had those connections, even after they had perished. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Any, any thoughts on that? Because it's Luke Skywalker. No, that's a great, that's a great point, because you're right. When when he realizes Uncle Owen and Peru have been killed, he says, there's nothing holding me here. And Obi-Wan takes him along with the idea that, yes, you should train to be a Jedi, but also we need to get this information to, to Alderaan or else people are going to die. So it's not so much, you're right. You're absolutely right. A. A. Boomer. I, I hate the empire. I need revenge. It's I need to save people. And then when they're on the death star, it's, I need to save princess Leia. And uh, you know, then when it comes to fighting and fighting the empire, it, again, it's to save people. And that's, mm -hmm. that's just, um, it reminds me of the, oh, um, it reminds me of the classic scene in captain America, the first Avenger, when Dr. Erskine comes in, you guys know what I'm going to say. And he uh, he's testing him a little bit before he's going to accept him into the super soldier program. And he says, so in, in Dr. Erskine's Germany, he says, you want to kill Nazis, huh? And uh, he says, you know, he's hesitant to answer. Is this a test? And he said, you didn't answer my question. Do you want to kill Nazis? And finally, Steve says, I, I don't want to kill anybody. I just don't like bullies. And, and, and what he means by that is I will stand up for people. I will. Right. If it, it in, a, in a concept of war or, or the context of war, I will kill if that's necessary, but it's not 
to kill them. I don't right. want to other them or hate them because of their nationality. I want to stop the evil in the world. And that's he that's heroism. Mm -hmm. That's just perfect. So yeah, I like that. Well done, yeah. Asian Boomer. Yeah, and thanks for providing that um, extra example. Daniel Craig says, I'm thinking it's not just the music or English programs that are contributing to this. Other courses train the disdain and dis deconstruction. Um, other courses train that disdain and deconstruction is the means to give them, yeah, is a means to give them a, uh, to attack. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's this, uh, I, I don't know. I, I just I just feel like people, um, I, I, I've said this before, they, <clears throat> almost hard for people to see that things are loved <laughs> I, I, you know it's like they, they, they get upset with you like well in my case with music it was you know you, you don't understand new music therefore you don't like it you just have mm -hmm. to go back to Brahms and you have to go back to Beethoven and Tchaikovsky and stuff yeah. like that um well number one there's nothing wrong with liking only those composers because they mm -hmm. have more than enough to provide for you wholesome very good, very beautiful, very well crafted, very well crafted music. So it's not a crime to like those and only those. Th those are your preferences. Yeah. Uh, but it, it's like, no, you you can't. You can't mm -hmm. like something that's beautiful. You can't like something that's whole. We we want to attack it, uh, and that's the sentiment yeah. that I've been. Given. And that, that's the sentiment that I had experienced as a, as a music student. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I. With, I with you or, yeah, no, I think you're you're onto something when you say that uh, they they don't like it when people love things or whatever. There is a there is a sense that they don't like it when anything is held sacred. Uh, yeah. And we see this on a societal level, but we also see it just on an individual level in your lives. This is one of the things when I did my book on uh, heroic inspirations, my chapter on Batman dealt with Batman's struggle with the Joker, and I point out how Batman is all about his moral code. You know, yeah. uh, people justice, people need to be saved. And he will not kill. If you take that no kill away rule away from Batman, you utterly deconstructed him past the point of ever reconstructing him. You can't give him a little phase. You can't do that to him. And I say because, and, and for the Joker, it's such a cool dynamic. And feel free to steer me away from this if you don't want me to go on this. Oh, no, that's fine. <laughs> the superhero binge. But uh, yeah. Batman has this code, this rigid moral code, and the Joker right. becomes obsessed with getting Batman, not just defeating Batman, but making Batman violate his own code. Yes. Yes. Because the Joker believes in nothing just as much as Batman believes in something. Mm -hmm. And so they both believe in it so much that they become these kind of polar uh, you know, opposites that they, they kind of need each other, good fighting evil. But at the same time, as long as Batman exists, the Joker can't be completely right. Because the Joker thinks nothing means nothing. But here's this right. one person who believes in something so much that it threatens that worldview. So the Joker is constantly coming up with, with little tricks and trials and, and uh, schemes to get Batman. Oh, you have to choose this or this. What are you going to do? Now you have to kill. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and I liken that to that's our daily lives. If you stand up and say, I believe in anything. Whether that's your religion, or whether that's a, a you know an ethical thing, or, or something, or you believe in a historical interpretation, the second you do, people come out of the woodwork and try and challenge you just because they don't like people holding to any degree of absolute truth, right. unless it's the absolute truth of question everything. You know, <laughs> so. Well, yes, absolutely. It's it's kind of like you know you and I have um uh, you have our faith, and and when people actually see a miracle or experience something miraculous. But, but don't believe where that could have come from. They'll just deny it. Mm. it it's, it's kind of that way as well. And I did want to clarify uh, Palin demo. Sound of keep this on the down low. Disney is getting rid of the community trilogy. <laughs> I, those are just my thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I mean, uh, yeah, it'd be interesting. It'll be, it'd be an interesting story. <laughs> um, just looking at for any more questions. Uh, oh, it looks like uh, Daniel Craig has something for you. Do you want to read it or do you want me to read it? Oh, sure. I'll put it up and I'll read it. Yeah, uh, Professor Geek, I've often wondered if we managed to scrounge some investors, how many people who agree with us from Hollywood could we peel away and create something new? Isn't there some company? I don't know the the ins and outs of them, but they're, they're called like Leap. Legion or something like that. Maybe I've got that wrong, but some company that's doing that with like uh, public investors, they did that Anne Hathaway movie with the, uh, the, the, the giant and stuff like that. I think, I don't know if that's what they're doing or if you're, if you're talking about something different, but I do think you're on the right track. I think, especially with everything that's going on in the world today and how that's affected industries. 
and how so many people are turning to making their own stories, mm -hmm. selling them even. And we're, you know, there's always talk about these or that characters going public domain or not. I think that the, the, the copyright holders of these beloved characters are losing their, uh, their, their unquestioned status as, you know, we are the ones that give you these stories. You can't look for them anywhere else. You certainly can't create them by yourself. Uh, so yeah, I, I've seen people it's, you're not seeing as many people, you know, do independent films as you are, uh, you know, write their own comics or write their own books because that's a little bit more involved and a lot of money involved as well. So, but yeah, it's a good point. Yeah. Very good. Thank you, Daniel. All right, Steven Cruz, I think has something for me. I like one and done stories. Actually, I've, I'm there with you. Everybody just wants franchises now. Just imagine if they tried to make a sequel <clears throat> to Blanca, which we will see, hopefully, <laughs> soon. <laughs> yes. Uh, that'd be terrible. Yeah, I mean, I'm not against um, serialized stories or, or, or art, mm -hmm. uh, but I do like, you know, one thing, I mean, I haven't really looked into it myself and I, I have something to finish, but, you know, I used to, you know, really look into writing short fiction. I love short mm -hmm. fiction. Um, actually, David Stewart, I need to retweet his um, his uh, blog uh, the other day where, where I think short fiction needs to come back. Uh, the problem is, uh, unfortunately, even the science fiction magazines, I, I haven't read anything this year because I canceled my subscriptions. Even, even Asimov and Analog, uh, they're, they're so bent on, um, you can almost see the anger in these authors and, and these, these, <laughs> these submissions, these manuscripts that are just, I was like, I, I, I just can't do it. And, and I, I think I remember telling you or someone where, where just the, these, these protagonists are quite the opposite mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> or they're just straight up the way they behave and, and, and do things to society. They're, they're, they're villains that they're mm -hmm. not. They're, they're, you're more or less writing from an antagonistic point of view. And so I, I stopped there. Uh, but I, that's not to say I don't think short fiction is, is lost. It, it needs, I think it needs to be revived. Uh, yes. Because short fiction is, is, is a really good format. It's, it's, I, yes. I love it very much. I, I actually do enjoy writing it. I've got to get back to that actually. Uh, Cause I, I, unfortunately, Stephen Cruz, I am working on the longer stuff. <laughs> um, but yeah, I like, I like the one and done. I think, I think mm -hmm. that's a, a good form. We, mm -hmm. we talked about Hobbit and I'm like, I, I kind of wish they just stuck with the linear <laughs> progression. <of> the <laughs> but yeah, you want to add on to that? No, no. I mean, I, I, uh, I, I agree. I short stories. I'm primarily a short story writer. It's, it's, you know, I've been working on one longer form. It's taken me forever just because I like those short stories. I, I tend to gravitate more towards it, but there, there's a, there's the, 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 you can achieve something with short stories that you can't, who was it? Oh, I can't remember. Was it, it might, was it Stephen King or somebody else? But they said, uh, you know, novels, you know, they're one thing, but, uh, but a good well-crafted short story, they said, is like the like a kiss in the dark from a stranger, you know. You read it, and if you've read, it, if it's written well, you read it in one setting, and then you're like, "What just happened to me?" <laughs> you yeah. know, if, if it's because as, as Edgar Allan Poe said, it should be read or, or should be written of a length that can be read in one sitting, so you can get the whole effect, and then everything about it, from the prose to the word choice to the uh, structure of it, should all be geared towards uh, achieving an effect in the reader. So that it is, whether it's a gut punch or whether it's uplifting or whether it's, uh, you know, whatever effect you want to achieve, you can really do it quite profoundly with a short story because you don't have to have somebody invest a week or even longer to take my take for a novel. And then to think about all these different threads and everything, it can be a little bit more concentrate, I think. So. I, yeah. And, and to add on to that, to me, reading a short story could be the length of watching a film mm -hmm. it, 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 in that one sitting, as, as you did say. Yeah, very good. Uh, Owen Lister says, Sound Graver, that's how I viewed the Indiana Jones trilogy. It ended just fine and didn't really need a fourth entry, and I didn't even watch the fourth one. <laughs> <laughs> good. You saved yourself a lot. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. And we can still keep talking. It looks like they have... Oh, Troy Pichelli has something for us. For both nice. of us. Who wants to read? Cool. <laughs> um, I 
Troy says, I feel that while this may not have always been true, this trend of deconstruction is nothing but nihilism and more so deconstruction for deconstruction's sake. I think mm -hmm. that's been recent because it's, as I just mentioned before, it's, it's so, it's so overused. It's, it's mm -hmm. the, the format is quite abused. I think it has its function. I think it has its place. It's um, in, in music, it's an approach. And see, the thing is, as, as an undergrad, and I may have said this before, I all, I only, in my naivete, only saw it as an approach. Mm -hmm. I, or or um, kind of, a, you know, you have the, the, the composers behind you as a sounding board to, to continue uh, experimenting. So I actually did see deconstruction as as an experiment, but as mm -hmm. one as one approach, not the end yeah. all be all. And I think that's where, where it's morphed to now with different uh, forms of art, where it's the, the end all be all. And sure. I'm sure it's been with your, your experience as well. Yeah, you can, uh, you know, even as a writer uh, trying to, to work on a story when you run into problems, I mean, you're using some deconstruction. Okay, I don't know what to do with this character. They're kind of falling flat. Well, deconstruct them. Write a chapter yeah. about their backstory, right? You know, it might not make it into the final work, but it'll give you a better, you know, view of them or whatever um, are a problem. You know, you don't really like, like the the logic of this mission that they're on doesn't quite make sense. Well, uh, really write a chapter of just zeroing in on how that started or whatever, you know, and, um, and yeah, that's ways to pick things apart because then you know how to put them back together. That's, uh, that's brilliant. Um, and I think that has to do, you know, you're talking about nihilism because you were talking about science fiction ago. And, and I know, I know you like Asimov. I know you like foundation. So I know you've already heard this, but I'll just read it because it's so appropriate. And especially with thinking about nihilism, like the, uh, what uh, what's what's the point or what's the purpose behind these stories? Is it to provide something positive or just to look at how I question that? Aren't I so avant garde because I question that or something? You know, it's, that's not it. But as well, the phase new act <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But uh, the famous quote by Isomov talking about science fiction, he says, individual science fiction stories may seem as trivial as ever to the blinder critics and philosophers of today, but the core of science fiction, its essence, has become crucial to our salvation if we are to be saved at all. And of course, he's talking about saved as a culture, as a society, because in science fiction, it's a mythology. It's also a place to try out the consequences of technology. It's a place to um, speculate. It's a place to champion the human spirit despite what may come. And, you know, this is the thing. This is the tools. This is the purpose of science fiction. It's not just well, in my dystopia, everybody's on antidepressants and whatever. I don't know. You know? Uh, there's it's the it's the motive or the uh, purpose behind writing. I think. Oh, it's absolutely. I, you know, I wasn't a, a total fan of Brave New World, but there was there was an element of uh, that that depravity you do need because that's actually I wish people did explore in in, in Hollywood and all these produce uh, you know productions as I had seen very brilliantly done in science fiction writing and in, in, in the short stories especially, but also in the classics as well, is that uh, you know. Okay, so if you're so into the edginess and, and the, the, the fall of mankind, if you will. Um, now, of course, I, I believe in redemption, but, uh, let, w but you know, what comes before redemption is, is some form of depravity. Okay, explore mm -hmm. that. F fine, explore it. But I think it's, 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 it's coming from a now a, a current mindset that, oh, this is what it is. It, there is no hope. This, this is yeah. what we are. This is who we are. And at the same time, it's, it's kind of dichotomous that, that they're trying to expand. They're trying to make their own utopia. <laughs> it's just really weird. <laughs> like, there's yeah. no hope, but we're going to try to make a new world. <laughs> yeah. And the only thing Actually, we can think is an, another world with no hope. <laughs> yay. Very good. <laughs> um, so Stephen Cruz, I have to, I have to point this up. Saddam Griever, I said hi in the beginning, but you missed me. Single tear streaming down my face. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Stephen Cruz. So hi uh, he again. Can, he can ring on the heartstrings, can he? <laughs> yeah, he, he's making me feel guilty. <laughs> and uh, let's see. Oh, you know what? I did. I'm sorry if I didn't mention Wolf Ten Media. He is still here, or he just came here. I'm all. Well, He's been around. <laughs> I'm just trying to catch <laughs> up with that. Uh, Owen uh, Lister says, what if I like metal more than other music genres? Yeah. I mean, that that's the thing. It's like, you can, you can only like, may like just one. Mm -hmm. well, let's say you just like bluegrass. Fine. It's it's okay to like just one thing. Um, 
I, I always think that people, it, by the way, that's actually not attacking you own Lister. Um, that's a, I, for me, it's it, it, the sentiment with new music and composers of new music of you know the 20th and 21st centuries. At least, at least my from my experience, this is just from my experience in Seattle. Uh, that they, they 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 didn't like the idea that you could like new music and old music. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> like you, you like Beethoven? Well, you won't like my concert. I mean, okay, they're, they're not as embracing as that, but it's kind of, yeah. it's kind of like that. It's kind of like, um, you know, it was it was like that Alan Bloom quote that I that I put on on your group where, hmm. um, th th this idea we have this is it, again it's it's like this ubiquitous idea that the past is 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 poor in intellect. Mm -hmm. It's more contemptible. It's not as educated as us. So thereby, which makes no sense, obviously, but because it's linear, we're seeing things linear. And we're seeing things now. Well, now that we have the technology, now that we have the medicine, now that we yeah. have all these new experimentations, well, you know, the, the the past is is so uncouth compared to our sophisticated questionings and tastes. And mm -hmm. you know, when you go back to listen or even read a Beethoven score, it it blows your mind. And and mm -hmm. they didn't even have the technology back then or the acoustics. That's what blows my mind. Haydn and Beethoven, they didn't have the acoustics and science of sound that really almost can be perfected in something that's post-production like a symphony recording or a giant beautiful acoustically treated concert hall that's the, mm. that's the amazing thing too is they, they they from their head they just wrote it on ink and there it was i mean that that's yeah. something to marvel at but anyway yeah if, if you i remember i mean this isn't this isn't so much superheroes you can steer it back if you want to but you're talking about music and i like you know <laughs> talking about the uh you, you can't like these people if you're going to play this kind of music i remember when i was um when i was just you know playing in bands and stuff like that uh it was in the grunge era like the 90s you know and that was um there was this idea like oh that's that's too progressive we're, we're so beyond progressive rock you know you just gotta it's, it's it's the days of nirvana and three chord songs and stuff like that nothing wrong with that that some of those songs can be wonderful and a lot of fun to listen to but yeah that sort of privileging one style over another because it's new because it's the one that you know right. now that you know everything that came before it was just there to get us to this point you don't need to go revisit it or anything you know that's <laughs> yeah that's, that's that's close to home right there that is true. <laughs> and I uh, think you have a question from Owen, if you wanted to nice. read. Uh, Professor Geek, you only question everything more than finding answers. Where does that leave you? A mystery box. Cough, cough. Abrams, cough, cough. <laughs> you know what? Um, I wasn't going to say anything because I didn't know how much pushback I get from this in the chat. But Abrams does this a lot. He doesn't plan out an end when he starts a series. Now, uh, Troy and Nanette have watched Fringe. I haven't watched Fringe. I think that was Abrams, wasn't it? Uh, but so. Lost. Lost is another one that got this flack a lot. It, 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 so many people loved Lost because of the cool things that happened during the season. And I know it had great actors and, and really cool mm -hmm. characters and such. And then in the end, so many people were like, really? Really? It That's was so, so it was purgatory. Okay. You know, it was like, it just fell apart. And you know, it, um, and yeah, and it's because of his mystery box. Let's write to the next mystery box. Let's write to the next cliffhanger. And that's poor writing. That's really poor writing. Right. Might might make you money in Hollywood. It's sad that that <laughs> it does, but that's the case. You so. know, I I don't know his videos. I feel like he's done a stream, and I know I feel like he's done a video on this, but I'd have to look. Uh, but David Stewart talks about these 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 different phases, especially when when a corporation takes on an IP, and he specifically. Um, uses this term, the milking phase. And I think that's the third or fourth phase. I think it's the third phase where you're just milking it as, as much as you can. And, and well, and these aren't his words, but it's kind of like until the milk kind of curdles, you know, it's, it's just <laughs> no good anymore. Yeah. And that's even, uh, you'll see that in the publishing industry. Like the, uh, the one longer story I have, it was good. Like I finally got to the point where it's like, okay, this could be, this could be a short fantasy novel, you know, but when I was still making a fantasy, not science fiction or space opera. And um, I submitted it to a publisher and the publishers loved the story. They said, this is really great. We'd like to publish this, but we're concerned because you said this is a, a closed story. And if we, you know, we don't want to put the resources and the money into this and promoting it and selling it, if it's just a one-time thing and we can't capitalize on this popularity 
for part two or for a further 10, 10 book series or whatever, you know? So, yeah. And, and you know, that's the thing is that I'm not against series. If you need that length for the complete story. Exactly. exactly. I can't, I can't imagine starting book one, for instance, you know, for, for, for my own story, I don't know whether it's four or five installations. I know. And it sounds, it looks like it's going to be more than three. Um, but I still have a beginning, middle, end. I, I know mm -hmm. I, I, I've had the end dreamt up for, for years now. I know how it's going to end. Um, as far as in terms of length, I don't know how, but it, it will, it'll be the, the, the appropriate length for, uh, for that story. Yeah. Let me, uh, well, do you have another question to, to, oh, are, sure. are they if, if, if there's someone on chat or. Yeah. Yeah. Feel free. But I was just going to ask you a question because you mentioned, uh, redemption. Uh, in stories and how, you know, and we both enjoy that, you know, good redemption arc in a story as a reader and a writer, what do you think is, where do you think the line of redemption is too much? Ooh. Like, uh, Oh, I of course they're a, redeeming this. Game. Oh, I already have a character. Oh, who is it? Oh, I don't think Brian Gilmartin is here, but I've seen his comment on, on, uh, on your Facebook page. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember. I, I remember this being a response, but uh, my response to someone, but I can't remember who, um, maybe it was a response to me <laughs> in a chain because I don't know how Facebook works. <laughs> but the um, you know, we we've had uh, in the last few years we've had a, a Voltron reboot. Now the mm -hmm. thing is, I and that was Netflix. I hadn't really known Voltron um, as as a story. I sort of know it now. Don't know the ins and outs of the characters. I just kind of uh, sometimes from time to time, if I feel like it, I'll just watch some some episode on YouTube. It's kind of entertaining. I I, I really. I really do enjoy that, but I didn't grow up with the Voltron uh, series sure. in the eighties, but I, I looked at the uh, animated series for, for Voltron here. Uh, I, I, I enjoyed it. I, I don't know what it was uh, in comparison to, to the original series. I, I know there were huge changes. Um, I guys, I'm sorry. Kind of like with the last Jedi, I did it for the music. <laughs> I did it for the sound design. Cause it was beautiful animation and just, well, oh, the soundtrack is amazing. So I even just followed the story just to listen to the great soundtrack of the, um, oh gosh, I don't know the actual chat, if you want to put it, the, the Netflix title, Voltron, I think the last Defender or Defender of the Universe. I can't remember. Uh, there have been uh, installments, but <clears throat> on Redemption. So spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't seen the, the eight seasons of Voltron. Um in the end, the final battle, we have um, Hanerva, which is uh, actually, uh, she was the uh, Altaian uh, form uh, before she became uh, Haggard, the witch. So she's completely evil. She, she's a witch, but she, she co goes back to her kind of human Altaian form. Um, and she is, she, she basically sees at the very end, well, if, if no one wants her, in, in her world, like with her old husband or her son, no one wants her in the world, then she's going to destroy the whole world. She's going to totally mm -hmm. annihilate the universe. And she was, she was well on her way. Well, certain chain of events happen where Alora, um, the, the princess Alora, she, she redeems, uh, uh, Hanerva, um, the, the villainess actually all the, all the bad guys are redeemed. Okay. <laughs> um, but she was the most evil that she was the final villain to take down. Uh, the problem was, it wasn't so much against her redemption, but the problem was Alora actually, in order to save the universe that Hanerva was about to destroy, um, she had to sacrifice herself. Now, the mm. way she sacrificed herself, unfortunately, was the same fate that Hanerva had, meaning you had the hero and the villain. So someone who's virtuous and someone who's total, this total nihilist, I mean, in, in every way, had this, succumbed to the same fate. And I said on the on the group page that that could be a likely outcome in real life, but it's not a good example of storytelling because what you're now seeing and what I thought I saw as much as I love redemption is you were seeing this universal redemption that mm. is almost nihilistic in itself that you could be the most wicked person. I'm not I, I'm not saying that the most wicked and by my faith, I don't think the most wicked person is beyond saving, but with with respect to the actual hero that virtuous character it, it, it's it's conflicting like oh none of this matters because we all have mm -hmm. the same fate anyway and that's not a healthy version 
that's not a healthy yeah. view, I don't think, of redemption. There is a truth and there's a cause to fight for. And yes, the wicked can be redeemed, but that that was really off putting in my in in my perspective. Yeah, yeah, that's a good uh that's a great that's a great um example. I would think um I haven't watched this, but just when you were the way you were talking about Voltron and, and, and that I didn't watch that reboot, but the way you were explaining it kind of put me in mind to think of this in terms of the opposite, because you know, we both do like redemption, but that's an example of too much. I also think though that there's um and again, oh man. All right, we'll see what the chat thinks of this. <laughs> uh, like, you're on my channel, you're safe. <laughs> <laughs> the uh The Walking Dead, this series. And I don't watch it. I'm not really a zombie fan, but everybody, you know, really loved it or whatever. Yeah, the reason I know this is because a lot of students would write papers about it. And they would write papers about the uh the the, the, the nihilism, the, the naturalist uh privilege, you know, I forget the the exact philosophical movement that it was based in, but they really did base the, the series in that and the idea that if you push mankind to the brink, they will just become beasts. Mm. And so like one of the themes you see over and over again in that series, I'm not saying that there aren't any good characters that do good things, but it's a it's a over overbearing theme that uh, you know. Even humanity, the humans who are running from the zombies are going to basically tear each other apart like a bunch of beasts if you push them far enough, mm -hmm. you know, and um, yeah, yeah, it might be cool to, to you might, might, you might gain street cred points or something saying that in certain circles, but, uh, but who really wants to, 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 to think that who really wants to keep putting that story in their mind over and over again, you know, I would, I would say, yeah, that's, that's a great example because you know, if, if you're running from the zombie until you become the zombie, I mean, that's, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, well, we, we're in a doggy dog world. I'm like, no, that's not how, that's not how the world works. Sorry. We're, we're humans. Yeah. We have humanity. There is, mm -hmm. there are terribly wicked humans out there, but there are terribly virtuous, uh, wonderfully virtuous. I mean, humans. Out there. <laughs> um, the, the, the movie that, that comes to mind that really approaches this, at least in my view, very well. And, and I hadn't read the book. Uh, so, so maybe you have, but, um, the road with Viggo Mortensen. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, Robert. Oh, who's the writer? Um, M M McCarthy. Or something? McCarthy. <laughs> yeah. I read his, yeah. I read his child of God. I didn't read the road, but yeah, he's, he's a bleak writer. Definitely. Yeah. And, and, and it was, it's just the journey of a father and son, uh, in this mm -hmm. apocalyptic world. And they're, they're surrounded by, you know, cannibalistic people and people just enslaving other people and and um, yeah. fighting people to the death for a can of food. But you see a lot of good virtue between the father and the son. And, and the father learns from the son with his with the child's innocence and the son learns to become a, a, a virtuous man um, mm -hmm. by the father. Um, and, and just examples of virtue in a very, very bleak and hostile situation. I think we need that because mm -hmm. I, I I think it's a very grim and and I would just venture to say sadistic view of of human humanity and and the the, the human person or the human being where we're we're, we're treated or we're seen no more than an animal. Like we're we're mm -hmm. really animalistic inside. Yeah. We, we may have yeah. you know civilization and these the, the technology and stuff like that, but really without all that stuff, we would actually mm -hmm. be animals. And I of course based on my faith I don't, and probably based on your faith. <laughs> that's, exactly. that's, that's not true. That's not true. Yeah, exactly. And I'm not saying and, um, I would overcome so, some some of those odds. I don't know. But mm -hmm. I certainly believe that people can. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think uh, certain stories too are uh, – where there's, there's certain deconstructions which are more in vogue than others. Like uh, – I, I never played the game Last of Us, but I, I understand that the first one was supposed to be so amazing. And one of the things that was supposed to be pretty nice in it was the relationship between the father and daughter, you know, and and the, and the love there and, and his trying to protect her. And I think there's even that in like, was it Bioshock or something like other game? I don't know. But there are games out there, you know, where the, the, the father, the relationship with the father is a big deal or – um. I think even the God of War game or something has that in it too now or whatever. But this new one apparently is supposed to, one of the things that people are upset about is how it just deconstructs that father relationship. And really, you know, and we're seeing that in general too, um, in popular fiction and whatnot, you know, uh, fatherhood is to be, even motherhood to be, you know, in certain circumstances and contexts is to be, you know, uh, frowned upon as well in this, you know, um, age and, and the politics are going on. But, but yeah, they we got to tear down children. the fathers. Yeah. 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 They, you know, they, they want your children. Are, <laughs> yeah, they do. They do. They want to no. They want to uh, program them. You know, they want to do yeah. that. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, if there's ever a time where we needed more father figures, 
and you just want to like dump on them all in public and fi popular fiction. That's yeah. What's going on with that? I think there've been YouTube videos made about that. Oh, absolutely. And you know, he's not, um, he's not an actual, actual, uh, literal father figure. Um, gotta go back to He-Man. Um, He-Man's yes. a father. Figure. <laughs> he's a father figure in that he is there when you need help. And every time that music theme enters, like when, when it's a child in a situation or, or a helpless villager or Tila or something, you know, um, one of his friends, you hear that theme and you know, things are going to be set right. And we need that. Yes. Need yes. That. I, I want, yeah. I want that, that theme resounding in my problems and, 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 and having, having a person who can take on the task with me that, mm -hmm. that that's stronger than me in this case. And I think, well, we, I mean, that's a whole other side. This is going to be for a whole other stream. Um, <laughs> I avoid saying a whole nother stream because that's not grammatically correct. Uh, <laughs> but, but we were very much inundated with this culture telling us we can do anything on our own, mm -hmm. that we don't yeah. help you know, do it yourself mentality, which is, it's got its function. But it's mm -hmm. like, I, but, but it, it, it goes, it goes um, deeply. Um, you know, it gets started, starts becoming entrenched in actual, the, the spiritual and the psyche, like, no, no, yes, I, I exactly. And that, exactly. that exactly. is animalistic. That is mm -hmm. survival of the fittest. So if you, yes. if you want that in its, in its strictest form, th then you are an animal because what makes us human is that, that community that we we have our strengths, but we do have our pitfalls where we do need help from, from not, not the community, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, uh, not from the yeah. nanny state but uh from oh. people. <laughs> yes there's so much in there you said first of all just a uh, visual aid yes. it's just uh, yes. yeah. yes. <laughs> but, but i love that you said um that's right yeah the music i can hear it in my heart <laughs> i have it stuck in my head right now <laughs> But you yeah. said that when he shows up, you know, and you know that he's that the people are going to be saved, and that's that's part of a hero story for a for an aspirational hero, in particular, you know, a Superman story. When when Superman shows up on the scene, if you're telling a story in which some people are afraid of him and some people are concerned about his, you know, his existence, and you are miles away from telling the proper story for that character's right. archetype, and they should know that they're going to be, uh, you know, you know, saved, and that and that does something for us too, even though they're not, there's not always going to be you know, a, a hero is going to show up in our lives necessarily and, and fix everything, you know, or stuff like that. But we need to believe that that is possible. We need to believe that we can be that person for other people. And mm -hmm. that's really when it gets to the American monomyth, you know, which um, Joseph Campbell talks about the heroic monomyth, you know, in the, in the, in the hero of a thousand faces, how the, all these mythologies are fictions are legends or whatever, basically kind of follow a, a, the same formula. Well, the, there's a uniquely American version of that. And one of the things unique about the American version, you talk about the community, you know, and, and stuff like that. Um, th these these writers I talk about in some of my videos, they say that over and over again in American stories, we tell these stories about a problem as a society and a problem comes to the aside society that the institutions of that society are powerless to overcome. So the police can't do it. The government can't do it or whatever, whether it's an alien or some sort of corruption from within. But the hero, the hero has to rise up an extra, you know, institutional hero. So not like one of, not a congressman, not, not usually even a policeman, you know, but a, but a horrible detective or a superhero from another planet or something like that has to rise up and, and, uh, and, and in very much the same way as a Christ figure, self-sacrifice to save things, not take the praise, not stick around, but go back and be Clark Kent or go back and be Prince Adam, you know, or whatever. And, uh, and, and live life as everybody else, because it's that self-giving. And that doesn't, that doesn't, in any way teach us to not not do anything for ourselves that inspires us to be that person for others and if and if we're going to have those institutions in our society actually be uh you know stronger or more effective or whatever it's going to come from the individuals within it striving to that kind of heroism inspired by that kind of story so. I'll, I'll use a small a real small life example uh, as an example of that of of you know we i think it's it's okay to it is okay. It's it's totally fine to 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 revere the person who can save, um, because if you if you if you look to that and look up to that, then that actually does inspire you to do something as you just said for others. So, for instance, mm -hmm. a pretty practical example was you know for for years I didn't drive a car, and and I I, I was always kind of hesitant asking for a ride. You know, if it was late at night and I just didn't feel like staying at the bus stop 
or I had a long walk ahead of me. And then, you know, I'd have, you know, friends say, oh, let me come get you. And now that might not be a, a big deal to some people just swinging by and, and picking me up, but they, they saved me time. They saved me mm-hmm. that, that kind of travel, or maybe maybe even they, they saved me from, from being mugged if it was so late at night. Yeah, and yeah. I thought, well, yeah, now I have a car. I, you know, I want to help people. Uh, you know, get rides too. So it's, it's a, it's a little act, but, but that, that generosity that people that I knew uh, gave me at the time when I was in need, well, that, that actually stirs in me to say, well, how can, how can I do the same for someone else? So it's, it is kind of a, it's this beautiful chain reaction because if we don't feel like we need saved or we don't revere that we need saved, then, then we are truly looking out only for ourselves Mm -hmm. in the end. I think that that's what it is what it would come yeah. down to yeah pay it forward yeah i think keely chow is here welcome keely chow um daniel is expanding on oh i can't fathom not liking <clears> both <throat> the old and new music i like that i can have a route that goes forward and backwards and not just stuck at the same point yeah that's that is so true and and i i've, I've said before too that you know music is a temporal art piece of art so so you have to have this sense of time and the sense of progression. And I don't think, you know, really progression is not eradicating what's come before it. Mm-hmm. Progression is using what has come before as the sounding board to keep moving. Um, yeah. and so people need to know their definitions. <laughs> <laughs> um, I agree. I agree. And it also says to you, if you wanted to read it or yeah, Abrams gave a Ted talk where he actually said that what's inside the box doesn't matter. Literally his stories are about nothing. They contain nothing. It's just his dumb box. What he's going off on. You're absolutely right. I, I seen the Ted box, Ted talk. And this is what I talk about on our Tuesday night. Noir is some of our stories where people today are trying to use the MacGuffin that Hitchcock was a master of in storytelling mm-hmm. and they don't do it well. They don't do it right. So yeah. the, the, the MacGuffin, I think everybody knows what MacGuffin is, but if, I can describe it if you want. But um, just the idea of there's something in the story that moves the plot along. Ultimately, it doesn't matter what the thing is because the story is truly about how the characters are, are growing in their pursuit of it, uh, how they're interacting with each other and stuff like that. So, you know, we recently watched um, Notorious, you know, and the MacGuffin in that was the uranium in the champagne bottles, you know. It could have been gold. It could have been anything. Those, you know, the the new neo Nazis or whatever were trying to to uh, you know get um, get across or whatever. But the story was really about what was going on with her care, Ingrid Bergman's character, Cary Grant's, and um, and what's his name's character as well. You know, that was the story. So at the same time, though, it it's not a this not so that's not a story about nothing. That's a story about. Uh, telling the truth of yourself and trusting others and, and, and the romantic relationship was there and, and, and you know, the espionage and stuff like doing the right thing, even if it, you think you might need to do the wrong thing, what's the moral quandary there, you know? And uh, th- that's, 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 that's not a story about nothing at all, uh, but it does have a MacGuffin, you know, or, or as Abrams might alter it into a mystery box. And that's just, uh, but yeah, if it's nothing at all, then it doesn't matter what it is. It just matters that people stuck around and watched the next incarnation to see what it was. And that's, right. That's that's treating your audience horribly. That is just not respecting anybody, your characters, your audience, or anyone. I I think uh, I think what people also respond to lately, they they don't like their intelligence insulted. Mm-hmm. Like like oh you think I'll take in anything, you know mm-hmm. you know you, you develop taste, you develop preferences, of course, but but when people say oh no they'll they'll like it because it it's got their their logo or their characters mm-hmm. or something like that and and i i think even even if it's a subconscious level i think people respond to that they kind of react to that saying no some something's not right and i feel like with all your money and resources you could have done better <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely absolutely true oh let's see oh interesting Age of Boomer, I see, I watched like the first two seasons of Fringe and it just got a little too much for me and I was moving at the time, so I never got back to it. Although John Noble is cool. Uh, Fringe actually had a good ending, which is why I suspect Abrams didn't write it. I wonder if he didn't write the final season. I, I don't know. Troy, you know, Troy would know that, right? Yeah. But a lot of times those producers, they'll they'll uh, they'll get the ball rolling and they'll hand it off to somebody else. But the thing about uh, that, that does make me want to watch Fringe, and again, Troy and Nanek maybe can attest to this, is I've heard that archetypic archetypically it's basically fantastic four 
you know, John Noble's the thing, you know, and you've got Mrs. and Mrs. The, you know, the invisible girl, you've got the, not, not in terms of the powers, but in terms of the, of the family of them and the way they mm -hmm. interact with each other and stuff. And there's the trickster guy, you know, the Johnny blaze or whatever. So I'd like to watch it and, uh, and try to make those connections and see what, see what it's like. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Thank you, big Al. We always like you hanging around. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for not raking me over the coals, big Al for the, Battlestar Galactica thing. <laughs> maybe, maybe he wrote this before you said that. I oh, that's know. right. Maybe that's coming. Maybe that's coming. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Y. Dr. Y has technical troubles. We haven't heard that oh, no. before. And actually, Bluetooth. And my, my mom was saying, you should get a Bluetooth. Uh, I was like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not always trustworthy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Owen, Owen points this up. It, it is, you know, actually... I don't know what um, this means, but I haven't put up Wolf 10 Media's logo on, so but it wouldn't be the same universe. I have no idea what that means, Wolf 10, but I just wanted to acknowledge you. <laughs> um, but Owen says, I'll only have two redeemed villains, and and that's all. And and I think that's, uh, I think it's important. You know, I think redemption works pretty well with a, you know, with your archetypes, the sympathetic villain. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't, and for the little I know about Joker and especially his dynamic relationship with Batman, uh, I, I can't imagine redemption for him, but I could be mm -hmm. wrong. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm not No, you're wrong. right. Not wrong at all, no. Um, when the character's done correctly, it, it's he, he, he's a uh, an elemental villain. He's yeah. the force of nature. Uh, you can take him and deconstruct him and give him an origin where, you know, all these kinds of things happen. And then, you know, maybe if you do it well, the movie gets a lot of you know publicity, but that's still not the Joker. That's no yeah. longer the elemental force of nature evil. And, and we, you know, even though we know in real life that doesn't exist in humanity, any like, as you said, any human can be redeemed, you know, possibly, you know, hypothetically or whatever. But uh, but but there still are forces of evil out there. However, you yeah. contextualize that. You and I will contextualize that you know, spiritually, of course. But but you know there there's evil in the world. However, anybody wants to think of it. So what do you do with it? Well, those kinds of stories and those kinds of villains about the elemental evil villain help you and inspire you and help you work out how to how to take care of that evil. You know. Absolutely. And and ultimately, p evil in its pure sense, at or as you say, the elemental. Uh, can't be redeemed it, it, it's chosen not to yeah, what, whatever will form, is set right the, the the fate is set it's been it's been decided wolf yeah. 10 also says yes i was disappointed in the ending of voltron i you know i was fine up to season seven season seven had a really nice closure and then it just it, it went weird at first i liked it and but then the more i started thinking about the redemption i was like well i, I must be thinking it differently and, and incorrectly because you know, I'm a Christian. I'm, I'm, I'm about redemption just didn't sit well with me. And, I, and it took mm -hmm. a couple days to, uh, to, to realize why. Yeah. Uh, I, that's one of the things I love about star Wars universe so much is how redemption is just all throughout it, you know, but not too much, but, but it's, uh, but it's all throughout. I love the character of Revan in the Knights of the old Republic games. He's, he's one of my favorite Jedi's hands down now because of his arc and, and his, uh, you know, and, and it's an interesting redemption too. And it's even an interesting things that are revealed about his, uh, his, uh, you know, his fall to the dark side as well when it happened. But, but yeah, it's just fascinating. Redemption stories are powerful and they can be cliche. They can be poorly done, but when done, when done with a true, you know, master at the helm, man, they can really get you. Yes. And, and it has to be well done. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I would, I would say, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to see redemption also cheapened just just yeah. because, you know, maybe maybe the person likes the villain. I don't know. Yeah. Or the characters yeah. like the villain. I was like, well, OK, but if it's not done well. Mm -hmm. So, of course, Darth Vader had his redemption and, and became Anakin Skywalker. But Palpatine died. Mm -hmm. we'll, yeah. We'll for say yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. But he also, you know, if, you, if you're coming to a spiritual world. You know, it's kind of like that, that his, his, um, his essence, as we had seen come out of the shaft, that, that, that was it. That was, that was, mm -hmm. th 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 there was no joining the force with him. And, and yeah. that was definitely, um, depicted. Yeah. I was so, I don't know if you were too, but I was so worried about Darth Maul. 
It's like, oh, because everybody loves him as a villain. They keep bringing him back and keep hanging him around. It's like somebody's going to redeem him. Oh, my gosh. No, they didn't uh, in Rebels. You, they, you had a good ending for him. Yeah, that's right. It was one of the right. good things I, in Rebels. So. I have seen, I've seen a scene. I haven't seen the series, but I did yeah. see that scene. And, and it wasn't two-dimensional. You were still sympathetic with him, you know, and that's one of the things you liked about the character. You, he was crazy. <laughs> he wasn't anything right. to aspire to, but right. you kind of got where he was coming from on some level. And, it, and it, yeah, it was it was fun. And I, I, I did see um, at least an image, but I think I have seen the scene where, you know, um, he, he's kind of, Obi-Wan is kind of, is holding him. As, mm -hmm. as yeah, he he's dies, cradling him as he dies. Which, which yeah. is kind of, you know, it's it's how he did it. He, he yeah. held Satine before she perished. Or exactly. as she was dying, I was like, wow, that's oh, Obi-Wan's thank you, the best. Thank you. He <laughs> is, he is. I mean, to be able to, oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. think about the moral fiber. You know, when, before... I'm sorry if this is getting off track. We can jump back on. Oh, we can to always talk about Star Wars. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. But yeah, in Clone Wars, when uh, right before Darth Maul killed Satine, you know, this is the woman that Obi-Wan loves, you know, whether the Jedi code or not, he, he's in love with her. You know that at this point. And Darth Maul tells him, you'll never, you, you, you haven't yet understood the power of the dark side. It's so much more powerful than anything you could, you know, uh, you could, you know, conceive with your little light side stuff. And, and Obi-Wan basically tells him now, now try to conceive of the strength it would take to resist that power. Boom. Mm -hmm. Checkmate. You know, that's stronger. And uh, yeah, it's, it's easy and maybe it'll make you powerful in some way to lash out in revenge or this and that. And he does, he, he kills Satine and I didn't put it together. That's exactly the way he holds Satine, the way he's holding Darth Maul in the end. Cause he's killed Darth Maul, not out of vengeance, but because Darth Maul forced his hand to it. And in that moment, it's a, it's a, it's a sympathetic moment. It's even a, a kind of a, a touching moment between Maul and Obi-Wan when, Maul figures out that, oh, oh, you're here watching The Chosen One. And Obi-Wan says yes, and, and then Maul comes around to the point and says, well, he will redeem us both, or he will uh, he will avenge us both, you know, because he will be the one to take on Palpatine, who, right. of course, harmed Maul and, you know, Obi-Wan, stuff like that. So, yeah, yeah. and I love that you pointed out that that similarity in, their, in the poses, the holding. That is That kind of blew my mind. I'm going to think about that for a bit. <laughs> yeah, and, and as he says, he, he will avenge us both. And and still, it's 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 Luke doing that indirectly because he's he's there to save his father, which mm -hmm. in turn, exactly, his father, yeah. Yeah. and it, it's yes, yeah, that's it's just Maul's still tainted view of it, but uh, right, yeah. but, but it had it still has some poetry because without yeah. Luke, of course, Darth Vader would would not have done that. Yeah, some poetry. Um, I like that. Yeah, kind of like what we saw with the EU with the with the stones and with the Sabaoth and all that good stuff. Yes, yes. <laughs> I don't know what you're saying, Owen Lister. I don't think I know how to pronounce that word. So I. <laughs> <move on. laughs> uh, do you have a Darth Revan action figure within reach? Uh, it's no. within a few steps away. I could, I could, I could get it if you want. Well, you just you but... were saying Darth Revan is like let's let's do props. <laughs> okay, okay, one <laughs> one, one second. Uh, <laughs> one second. I am going to. Um... How do I do that? Oh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> because I'm not going to say anything about, yeah. That's fine. <laughs> My shirt is plaid. I'll be right back. <laughs> I wonder if, yeah, never mind. Um, I will bring up Wolf 10 Media. <clears throat> uh, Sound Engraver says, in media, nobody has a healthy familial relationship. Our, everybody argues with their parents a lot, a whole lot. I'm tired of kids challenging authority when they don't need to. That's the thing is I don't mind the kids demonstrating at an age of rebellion. But if it's needless, that's where I get. Because that actually, in effect, causes poor writing anyway, um, where, where the kid is, is just bad mouthing the parent. Mm -hmm. And where's, that, where's the writing going? Now, Boy Meets World, if you want good. And Boy Meets World, Growing Pains, Smart Guy, Cosby Show. So sorry, YouTube, I said it. Uh, <laughs> sorry. It's a good show. I shouldn't, I shouldn't, I shouldn't admit more than that. Um, but, uh, but good, good family dynamics. So anyway, before I get uh, cut out, you know, the stream stops. Uh, where's the turn <laughs> Revan prop. Well, I will say this, this is kind of topical because for a while they had Darth Revan and that was when he was a bad guy. Oh, he was, he was yeah. on the dark side, Darth Revan, right. you know, so that was a, that was an action. No, no, that was an action figure for a while. And that was, it was a popular one. 
I never got that one though because I my what I want on my shelf is a reminder of the the redemption and what he did. So eventually, there's the Re Jedi Knight Revan. Okay, and that is what I eventually got. The oh, he got the, the purple the, lightsaber. Yep, yes. he's got the purple, the white yeah. robe. He still got the Mandalorian mask that he has, but that's just that's yeah, that's, that's Revan. Yeah, that's awesome. Really cool. Oh, nice. But yeah. um, yeah, there's a little better. But yeah, you were talking about um, or the comment Wolf Jam Media was talking about children and parents and stuff like that. And uh, that reminded me, if you want to go down this road, if you want to jump to something else, that's fine. Oh, but, um, but that is a quandary in writing, too, because on the one hand, there's something to be said for stories where our young hero or our young main character has to step out from the influence or protection of his parents or of his family to kind of come into their own, a coming of age or something like that. And that's that's a powerful story, and they and they should be there, but they don't necessarily need to be contextualized in the sense that the parents were evil or were mm -hmm. neglectful or powerless or whatever. And you can even tell those kinds of stories where the family's still around. Um, mm -hmm. Raymond Arroyo is this uh, is this he, he's like a, a news commentator, but he's got this series of books. Um, he's like EWTN's news guy, uh, but he's got this series of books called um, Will Wilder. Yeah, and so they're they're you know for their children, and it's you know to kind of compete with the Harry Potters or the Percy Jackson and oh. stuff like that. But he's more of like an arc, like an Indiana Jones young kid, you know. But he goes on these missions, and his family's pretty much right there with him. Now he's still able to go do and grow and take care of the things, but his family are they're positive characters in the book. They're actually helpful, and they're not there to hinder him or what he must fight against. You know, at the same time, you know you have to strike the balance that they. He can't be relying on them too much because he has to have his own agency and, right. and consequences and stuff. But, but yeah, that's yeah. a good point. Good balance to have to try to strike. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm glad you brought that up, Prof. And then also, thank you, Wolf Ten Media, for for bringing that up. Now, I don't know the song. Do you know the song? Can you sing the song? <laughs> Bonnie Tyler, oh, I need to hear. <laughs> is it? No, it's not. We can be heroes. Is that no? The song? That's that's the I need a hero from. Uh, was it from Short Circuit? If I were here, I would be belting it right now. I know. <laughs> Al. You can do it tomorrow night. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Al's going to announce the movie tomorrow night. <laughs> the title. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, yes. And and Owen Lister agrees. Good book. Highly recommend Hero with a Thousand Faces. Might have to check yes. out The American Monomyth. Uh, the Amer now, the book The American Monomyth... I would read it if you're interested, because it does a great job of pointing out what the American monomyth is, but the authors are extremely agenda driven. So they spend the rest oh. of the book trying to pick it apart and say why it's a horrible thing. Wow. <laughs> so, so read it critically. But <laughs> How? So, so um, yeah, I don't know anything about composition writing classes in the academics, but I can imagine something in the syllabus along the lines of how to sound psychoanalytical. <laughs> I Definitely how to sound smart. Yeah. Um, oh, you know what? He said, he said you pronounced his name right. So mm -hmm. can you say it again? Because it's for you. <laughs> <laughs> Sir Torin Clegane says, Professor Geek, I don't think it's wrong for people to be reticent about Superman at first. Having it be their recurring plot element is the issue. Be a recurring plot element. Oh, oh, you mean the, uh, the characters, like when he comes in and what's a... Uh, yeah, one book that did this, uh, well, it depends on what you mean and where that reticence comes from. Because uh, may I, Superman. May I no, go ahead. Sure. Yeah. As you explain this, can I take take a step away and I'll be back in a couple minutes? You, you may, if, if I can probably do the same at some point in the future, because I'm sure it'll come around. <laughs> <laughs> this is, is going be to more, be, be more like rewatches. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But I'll leave the post up. So, so you okay, sure. It. Yeah. Uh, no, it's sorry. It took me a second to, to figure out what you're saying, but yeah, you're talking about the characters in the story and, uh, one good way that or one way that has been done. See, like, I, so if Superman were to pop on the scene, let's say he saves a train from going over the, the bridge or something like that. And this is his first appearance in Metropolis. You could have some news reporters or a person here or there saying, Oh, I don't know who this guy is. Should he be around? But the overwhelming sentiment in a Superman story should be, who is this person that just saved? How, wow, that's amazing. Um, but there, like, there are places, there are times for, for that to be the case. So, for example, in Superman Birthright, uh, you might have read that um, you know, by Mark Wade back in the day. 
it was a it was a retelling of Superman's you know coming on the scene and origin and such. And when he came on the scene and was it was actually revealing himself and fighting crime in Metropolis, uh, you know, of course, Lois was you know taken with him and stuff like that. There was a little bit of of uh, of you know who is this guy? A little bit, not overwhelming, and it didn't you know. Um, that wasn't the drama and the central melodrama of it. What, but what was interesting is Lex Luthor, of course, because he's going to be jealous of, of of anybody taking the spotlight for him. Devised this whole plan in that story to make it seem like there was a Kryptonian invasion coming along, and he was you know doing all these things and trying to turn the public uh, consensus against Superman. And he still had his heroes. Superman still had his heroes uh, or his um his supporters rather. And it, even in the midst of of all of these manufactured Kryptonians coming to to uh, destroy or conquer a met- metropolis or whatever you had uh, Superman down there on the ground fighting with the people who were being threatened. And that was a big deal for him. That showed them, you know, what it was and how amazing it w- of a character he was. So that was awesome. Um, so maybe that's what you mean. I don't know if you read that story, but yeah, I can see what you're saying. If it's done the right, if it's done to the right degree in the right manner, all that kind of stuff. So um, I don't know where that comment was or where that left off, but I will still try to look for some <laughs> See Nutter's comment. <laughs> um, her one word comment down there. <laughs> to see Sir Torn Clegane's. Yeah, okay, there it is. Okay. So I will scroll down and check it out. Uh, Troy Pacelli says about the fringe, he said on JJ and Fringe, we're, you're talking about TV. There's also the network to contend with. Never know if you'll have another season. That's a good point. That's a really good point. And so you'll see. For example, certain shows and certain seasons will be written with kind of a close in mind. That happened with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, that happened with um, Babylon 5 back in the day. So you're right. You, and, and usually if the writers are smart and if the producers are smart, they'll write to an ending, which those examples I gave did, where it you could see that as a feasible tie up, but you could also keep going. And that's hard to do. So uh, that's a good point, though. I was just reading Troy Pacelli's uh, comment after Wolf 10 Media. Oh, uh, is, uh, on Fringe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, great, great. And I'm happy to take it away. Go for it. <laughs> uh, ooh. Ooh, ooh, yes. Great comparison, Owen Lister. Uh, you can you can redeem Gollum, but not Sauron. Excellent great. point. That's well a stated. very good comparison. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, and actually, that's actually, I, I think that's what makes Gollum so tragic, a mm-hmm. character. Because he was... Not only was he on the fence coming to the light before evil finally mm-hmm. consumed him and temptation consumed him, he had someone who believed he would. Yes, yes. That, that made it worse. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't, you know, because I've only read Lord of the Rings once. So it's not, I don't know if it's as vocal, if Frodo's as vocal to it. Like he pities him. Mm-hmm. Is, yeah, is, yes, the pity yeah. it's the pity of Frodo that saves them all, they say. Or no, the pity of Bilbo for sparing Bilbo him back then. Him. But Frodo too and it's funny because as long as Gollum and it's tragic like you said as long as Gollum thinks Frodo believes in him he's trying to do the right thing he's trying to choose the right side of his personality and I forget exactly what the switch is but uh something happens it's a misunderstanding ultimately but makes him think that Frodo had uh had uh betrayed him or something like that and that's when it's like oh no no you know it's just so close it's tragic yeah uh, yeah I will continue Oh, do you know this one? I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not familiar with this. Speaking of redemption, the original Thunderbolts run from the late 90s does a pretty good job making your yeah. root for the villain, a bunch of former villains. Yeah, Thunderbolts, did they come before Suicide Squad? or the, I can forget which comes first, but they're Marvel's version of a bunch of villains who get together to form a hero team. Oh, um, so. Okay. Yeah, uh, Thunder, Thunder, uh, Ross, whatever, Thunderbolt Ross or whatever, the guy who's you know, usually after the Hulk, the general, is kind of heads them up. And I forget they've had different versions, different teams. I know John Malin did a great run when he was still at Marvel. But uh, but yeah, that's another example of, but even in that kind of dynamic, and I don't, I'm not crazy about a lot of the Suicide Squad incarnations of stories, but I like the dynamic and the idea that whether Thunderbolts or Suicide Squad, you can have characters in their process of redemption that may or may not take. It might end up, they might still go back to villainy in the end, but at least for the time being, they're doing the right thing, whether it's because they're forced to or not. It's an interesting dynamic. But I think my favorite Suicide Squad story is Arkham, I forget, Arkham Invasion, Invasion Arkham. It's the it's the animated series, or animated movie that's set in the Arkham Games universe. 
uh, and, and that's the Suicide Squad trying to invade Arkham Asylum. It's good stuff. But yeah, good point. Yeah. I know that was about Thunderbolts, but same thing. I wish I knew these <laughs> stories. <laughs> uh, let's see. Catching up with chat. Nanette has a comment. <laughs> I saw that too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so <laughs> it looks like you guys have just the dialogue going on oh something for me by wolf 10 media sound engraver what i mean is they challenge authority oh uh the, the children or, or or youth what what i mean is they challenge authority and endanger others and never take responsibility at all for their actions and it happens with female characters a lot now I don't know where I saw this video and it was a long, long time ago. Um, but I, I, there was a YouTube video, forgive me. I, I remember seeing it on YouTube, but I don't know the channel name where, um, the later Disney shows, the, uh, you know, of course I'm in college and, and so I don't turn into that. I, I grew up with growing pains, smart guy, <laughs> all that good stuff. Smart guy nice. great. Um, <clears throat> but I, I understand that after the early 2000s and getting into the 2010s, these these family or kids shows, you know, where of course the kids are the main characters, uh, they they were they, they they never learned good lessons on morals. Mm -hmm. uh, they seem to get away with a lot more, um, maybe a lot brattier. I mean, man, uh, Boy Meets World. If even Corey at a college age. Mm -hmm. talk back to his dad he was shut down <laughs> yes. I mean, that's, that's some good family dynamic yes. they yes. don't have that yes. anymore um a lot of um a lot of parents are kind of uh, adults in a way I i've seen mm -hmm. that uh, you know with smart guy uh the the mom's out of the picture because she she had a premature death or uh, you know she she died while the kids were still young so it was, it's a single father of three and mm -hmm. even though he was a single father and still kind of going between dating relationships and all that, uh, he still was in charge and he still had authority and he still had mm -hmm. presence and love in their lives. And, and I think that's definitely lacking where we're, well, it's kind of like that sentiment that we're seeing a lot where the, where the youth has changed the world and the youth know better. I'm like, are you kidding yeah. me? <laughs> yep. <knows> yeah. Better. <laughs> yeah. So Our I, generation I, will put it right. <laughs> or I, I've seen, and it's not a bad message. It's not a bad message, but what we see is, it kind of, yeah, our generation will make it right. Uh, well, they're, they're too busy fearing the, the end of the world. So I, I, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I, I saw it was kind of it was a little innocuous. It was, it was like this girl sitting in a cafeteria, and and the slogan was, "You're never too young to change," you know the world, which or her world in the cafeteria or something like that. Mm -hmm. I guess it's a positive message, but I think it's, but we're also seeing displays of very rebellious youth that don't, um, and they, 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 they look like normal kids, but then they mm -hmm. go on these antics and they don't learn from their mistakes and, and they, yeah. I don't know. So if you guys That's... who are younger in your twenties, if, if you'd seen those Disney shows that, you know, I was just too old to, to watch. Mm -hmm. Um, just, just let me know if that's been the case, because I, I, I got, I, I always have to go to back to the Boy Meets World and Smart Guy. <laughs> <So> anyway, <laughs> that's born out in, in history too, though. The uh, anytime a regime or an empire is toppled, no one ever sat around to think, what should we replace it with? <laughs> you know, so there's right. always chaos and and turmoil and barbarism and and, and all these things after it. And uh, yeah, yeah, but you know, I mean, we like, don't burn, burn, burn the building and tear it down. <laughs> we're builders now. Do, do, do we have exactly. What, what are we going to build? Oh, we, <laughs> we sent them to the guillotine. Whoops. <laughs> exactly. Um, oh, Nanette has something. Yeah. There you go. Nanette Netter, Netter's Network says, I need a hero. Um, excuse me. I need a hero. Starts off where all the young men. Go oh, I don't know how to read this. Got the lyrics. There's, where have oh. all the young men gone? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, is this a question? Sorry. <laughs> you, guys, you guys know me in popular music. I, uh, I'm, I'm pretty bad about popular music. <laughs> that is a good song. I don't, you know, I don't even know lyrics to Hotel California. All I know is the, the chord progression. <laughs> <laughs> Some people are lyric people. That's it. I'm, 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 I'm an instrumentalist. <laughs> mm -hmm. Understandable. 
Oh, Owen's got a turn in this evening. Need to get up earlier for work tomorrow. Good night, y'all. Yeah, good night. And we will wrap it up probably definitely by midnight. I'll have to. Yeah. And good luck on your on the comic, Owen, and in, uh, in your villain redemption and whatnot. Yes, you have too, and I think that's a good number. I think that's a good number. I I, I personally like um, villains redeemed myself. That's just my preference, but I have to have it well done. Mm-hmm. And I'm not yeah. I'm not beyond the elemental getting their comeuppance because it's mm-hmm. just it's just life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think these are references you'll know, but it is okay. also new. <laughs> that was what I meant. I think Secret Origin did it well. I'll have to check out Birthright. Yeah, yeah. Secret Origin is another good example, and that's it's even a better example because I, well, I just love Secret Origin because because of, of all the things that are in it. But Birthright's really good. Yeah, I think you'd enjoy if you enjoy Secret Ur- Origin, you will definitely love Birthright. Um, some people, uh, Linnell, you, I think I'm pronouncing his name right. The art's a little, a little more expressive. Uh, some people like it. Some people don't. But uh, but I think you'll like the story definitely. Very good. And uh, Assault on Arkham. Assault on Arkham. Thank you. That's the name of the movie I was talking about. Thank you, Wolfden Media. And Owen. And Owen. Thanks. And Daniel says, uh, the version of Thunderbolts I'm talking about is way before Ross. The original one was led by Baron Zemo and was a scam, but was then led by Hawkeye as he inspires them to do good. Oh, cool. I didn't, um, yeah, you know, in the history, I'm more DC than Marvel, but that's, uh, I like that idea of Hawkeye kind of taking them over and is sort of like the, uh, the father figure for all the the delinquents (laughs) and inspiring them to do good. That's, I'll have to check that out. That's interesting. And also Mr. Matchstick, welcome. He also says that. Assault on Arkham. Great movie. Looks like everyone. (laughs) (laughs) Trip Chili says, oh, to you. Fresh version of Suicide Squad came out 1959. Really, was it that early? But the modern version was in the 1987 miniseries Legends. Yeah, yeah, I knew it was like an eight, like a at least the recent incarnation of them was a was a recent thing. I didn't realize 1959 though was the first spark of the idea. Interesting. I love how this is slowly becoming a Professor Geek channel video. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's like, where am I? Oh no! I'm not. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm, by, by the end of the comments, I'm going to wait till you. And the broadcast. I'm like, oh wait, <laughs> no. I got to. <laughs> yes, of course. Kudos for mentioning Boy Meets World by Big Al himself. Yes, yes. Can't say much for Girl Meets World because I haven't seen it. <laughs> now, I know it's the original <laughs> cast, and of course it's we we love we you know Al we love that Corey and Topanga got together. That was so important for us to see, yes. and they're married still. And they've got children, which is awesome. Mm-hmm. You know, it's kind of like Superman. But, like Boy Meets World. Mm-hmm. but just because you can do a thing doesn't mean one should do a thing. What, what's that? Oh, you mean? Who, that, that's, just a need, that's just a needle big owl about Girl Meets World. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't. Well, here's the thing. I can't have an opinion until I watch it. Mm-hmm. But I don't know when I'm going to watch it. <laughs> well, <laughs> Disney Plus? Is it on Disney Plus? Maybe I don't know. I guess that's where it would be if it if it hits a streaming service. It's kind of like um. Th- they recently did. Was it called Fuller House from the Fuller, Fuller House? House? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was just I didn't fine watch that either. Nineties, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's just that nostalgia. It kind of comes around, and everything has to come back or whatever. And but you know what it does? It actually, in in a strange, sweet, sentimental way, it might make people sadder. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's like, well, I I like your character, but you're you're so much older <laughs> yeah exactly you're not, you're not supposed to be character. here yeah you're not supposed to be see old jesse here in the now he's supposed to be in the 80s and 90s and yeah. right now we have to oh i actually um uh i don't know this person so they might be an audience of yours frey lanx frey lanx i don't i don't think I recognize the name either but uh welcome uh and is that management <laughs> what is i think that? it means meeting Meeting villain, MTG villains no longer have any prejudice. Being motivated by only greed. Um, MTG. I don't know what the acronym means there, MTG. But uh, the villains no longer have any prejudice. That's being motivated only by greed. Yeah. Um, it depends on the villain. Like uh, you can have the sort of uh, social um, sociopath villains. Um, 
you can have the villains who are motivated by revenge. Uh, you know, um, the version of Baron Zemo they used in Captain America Civil War. I know that's not exactly the Zemo from the comics, but that is a, a, a good example of sort of the revenge type and stuff like that. So, yeah, um, don't know what you mean by prejudice. Like, uh, what are what are some examples of prejudice villains we've lost? Uh, you know, because that's, I mean, yeah, they've been out there. So, And you can also have, um, you can have altruistic villains that will push at any length to create a common good. But mm -hmm. what yeah. would it do before then? It's that's kind of like um, I think that was with Saruman, who mm -hmm. who thought he'd fight Sauron and end that order of things. Yeah. Um, but in doing so, he became corrupt and totally spiritually and power. You know, his power was just gone from that. Yeah. Delight. Yeah. Uh, Ozymandias and Watchmen, thinking that he was going to save the world by causing a. Um, an alien invasion that would kill a bunch of people just so people will find the, so the countries will finally work together or something like that, you know, and it, yeah, the, the end justifies the means, you know, that kind of yeah. idea. Well, it's kind of like, it's, I'll go back to the, I'll go back to the music example. It's like, we need art to shake up the world. I'm like, I think the world shakes us up. <laughs> just <pop. laughs> yeah. This is not the aristocratic uh, 1800s or anything. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, I, I guess, Oh, I think, uh, I, I don't know. Melissa Harris, might debate Al on this. Boy Meets World had <laughs> this agenda sequel called Girl Meets World. I don't know. Oh. I won't. Say, I won't say a thing. <laughs> I haven't seen it. <laughs> Al, 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 <laughs> <laughs> buddy. <laughs> but you know, Al, we 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 love your stance on enjoying the things you enjoy because right, I've... because we, we really. Uh, take a stand against that position, against, you know, of course, Al's enjoyment of things. What are we doing? We're being the nihilistic postmodern artist saying you can't enjoy this. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. We have a, we have, there is a fine line in the sand. And and see, Al is our, um, there, there's a synthesis. I, I think there's like, there's, there's Professor Geek, Fan Man, or maybe, I don't know what the hierarchy, but probably Fan Man on one level, Professor Geek on another level. And it's not like a level. <laughs> Or whatever, and then and then Al is like that. Oh, I, I had a synthesis relationship with you guys that I can't can't think of it. Al's the the puka, the positive influence that just sort of surrounds us all. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, because it's like the the the, the classic dialect. Um, you've got the thesis and the antithesis and the synthesis, mm -hmm. and I feel like no. I, I feel like more prof you are more the antithesis of something and then <laughs> Al is the thesis <laughs> and then your channel is the synthesis. Usually the case, yeah. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to point out that I finished an entire bottle of water, so now I've earned this. This is uh I'm, I'm, here's the thing. I this is a sidebar, but I actually thought your bottle of water was something just only the Catholic Bible Geek channel did. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, maybe it's just because it's Catholic Bible Geek. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a new Pope encyclical or something like that. Yeah, no. Queens. And if if you need a break, just let me know. <laughs> I will. I will. I, I will post it probably around midnight. Just catch. <laughs> and I then, didn't keep track of time. Uh, that's that's funny. I have I have to put this up, and I it's not because I agree with it. Okay. <laughs> wouldn't do that but melissa says professor geek is taking over the stream and then the world <laughs> shh don't tell anyone <laughs> well a certain platform is certainly not helping with that um, <laughs> big else says don't judge me <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah the the, the, oh, gosh. the bitmoji that's what he said in it. <laughs> i don't know if i can I, i'm not technically savvy as far as like pulling up actual images unless it's already on my tab. <laughs> yeah. Of course, multitasking. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to put the context again um, of something I said. That isn't true. Whatever I said in my past self, uh, you can't have an opinion. It just won't be informed. That's, that's also true. I, I agree hmm. with that. All right. Oh no. Oh no. No, Wolf Ten Media says I've seen more things in my previous moments. Is there such a thing? Now I yeah, they're doing a series on Netflix. I think my niece is into that. Um, 
I, I grew up with Babysitter's Club, both reading all the series and then also, um, oh, okay, so I had my Chronicles of Narnia, I had my Charlotte's Web, and I'm not saying Babysitter's Club was the best written <laughs> fiction, um, but it was enjoyable. Mm-hmm. And uh, they had, I can't remember which, what station it was on, but they, they had a show um, of the Oh, early. really? And I thought, oh, okay. of, you know, for, yeah, I liked it as a kid. Uh, mm-hmm. That that with Power Rangers, of course. Um, yeah, Dr. Y says, I'm back. Got my Bluetooth set working. Are you drawing nice. a Dr. Y? I'm trying to figure out what that is. Just Is it just a lion laying down uh, in this? I would say I recommend the blue lion, Dr. Y. <laughs> <laughs> that's, all I, that's all I say. And uh, actually, it looks like I caught up with chat. Okay. Uh, nice. So, so I think, you know, if, if, if you wanted to expand on something or we can definitely um, take the time to wrap things up. But, yeah, I wanted to do this video, um, the stream with you, Prof, because, well, I, I, I totally forgot to mention this. I should have started the stream with this, but actually that's how I, if, if none of you here know, that's actually how I got to know the professor geeks channel was his, his, uh, uh, video on stop deconstructing our heroes. It's, it's, the, it's the prof with the big stop sign in front of him. <laughs> You've got H- Henry Cowell, uh, Cavill, um, Cal is a composer, Henry Cavill, Superman, although fan man says he's not Superman. So Henry Cavill, <laughs> um, and, and, uh, Jake Skywalker. Mm-hmm. And and that's actually how I got to to know you you as as um, commentator of of all these things. So I, I think it's a, it's quite poetic that we are actually talking about this these these examples because while I've seen it in music, it's 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 in art in mm-hmm. in any art form. It actually has a literal definition in architecture, uh, but also it's in popular art, and and we see it with just. Well, real popular art that's been, you know, loved by the, the billions. Yeah. So I, I thought it was, I thought, you know, doing this stretch of, of things during the last few weeks on deconstruction is important because I think people need to, to, to see mm-hmm. that, that again, I think deconstruction has its place in history or it can be an approach. It can, it can have a function, yeah. but um, we're definitely seeing a kind of an, an insidious attack mm-hmm. on beloved stories, on beloved art by means of deconstruction. Uh, and so, mm-hmm. so that's actually yeah. anything else. Yeah. No, just, I mean, yeah. And you've said you've, you've spoken on this well, uh, quite well, uh, just don't buy yourself on your streams before stories, whether it was about clone wars or our different stories or whatever. So, um, but yeah, it comes around full circle. I appreciate the complimenting the video. Uh, it, um, I think one thing, if there's anything I would add to kind of round out some of the motives or the, or the things behind the deconstruction is the, uh, you know, I can't go too long without saying his name, but the Dan DiDio effect. Oh, sure. <laughs> so, sure. um, when it when it came to to the New Fifty Two, and certainly everything he did once he got back into power and, and yanked Rebirth out of the way, uh, he he has this this uh, what he says now. He still comes back, even though he's no longer working there. He comes back and tries to defend it with this this notion that the status quo of a story or of an ongoing series should always be shaken up. It's not going anywhere if you're not shaking it up and pulling the ground out from under people and this, this, and that. I mean, and he means that literally to the point of anything they might enjoy. You've got to change it up. You've got to do this. You've got, or then they'll get stale or whatever. No, I mean, think about your favorite stories and the in the in the ones that you go back to all the time or whatever. You don't you don't go back to them because somebody was always shaking it up. You go back because there are some constants in that in that story in that universe or in that series or, or just a book or whatever that that's so resonated with you, you know, your, your, your emotions or your spirituality or whatever, that you, you need that, you need that resonance. And sometimes you get out of tune, you know, in your daily life, you get out of tune because of the things that are happening in the world or things that happened to you that day, or maybe some places that you just kind of slipped up and fell down. And, um, you know, I mean, certainly, you know, religious, you know, we will, we'll have our ways of going back and kind of, you know, uh, healing ourselves spiritually, but, uh, but even psychologically, you know, stories, that's what, that's one of the beautiful things they can do is they can, they can, you can re-resonate yourself, reharmonize yourself with that resonance mm-hmm. in one of your favorite stories. And that's why we go back and watch our favorite movies over and over again. That's why we do that. Even if we don't know why we're doing it and well, why we feel better afterwards, that's, that's what it is. And that's what you can't deconstruct. So. Absolutely. And, and I can, I can, uh, I, I might, expand on that with with some of the material the first is mm-hmm. you know m- maybe just an example is instrument making 
you know, the violence has been around for centuries, but we still have people becoming uh, luthiers and, and, and studying school for this because people still want that violin sound or that, mm -hmm. that very specific instrumental sound that was, was coming out of Italy, you know, in the 1600s, or even something more, possibly more superfluous, but still ultimately human. Some people don't want you messing with their chocolate cake recipe. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's like, don't, don't shake it up. Maybe, maybe I'll feel like raspberry mousse tonight with white chocolate, <laughs> but I want my German chocolate cake as the baker has made it for centuries. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. So it's, it's like, what, what is, see, the thing is we have to ask what, 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 what's beyond that. What, what's the motive for shaking mm -hmm. people up? Really, what is the motive? And I can mm -hmm. think of maybe one or two things. I think the first is um, people people who want to shake society up, they're just not happy with society or 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 where where people always uh, fall to, where, where things mm -hmm. where, where things fall in place, the natural order of things. Um, sure. I think that's one thing. I also think that there, there's such a um, I would say egotism, uh, saying mm -hmm. well. With that, if you're not experimental, uh, you're you're not intellectual. You know, mm -hmm. you, you always have to push that line. Well, yeah, but how far do you want to push it? Like, where exactly. we, need, we need measuring rods. We need. Uh, I'm an experimentalist. Experimentalist. I love it, and I'll keep doing it. But it's like, you know, uh, we don't we don't want out with the old and with the new. <laughs> yeah, there are consequences to each level of pushing it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, thanks. You know, thanks for being on. Um, well, thanks for having me. It's been fun. Yeah, we you're, you're more than welcome to expand on those ideas, too. Um, I think because I oh, wait, I did want to say a couple things. Yes, I approve. I might <laughs> that new blue or I might might make that new blue lion icon. Yes. Um, yeah. That, and that's a good point. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Daniel says, I don't want my friend to mess with her. Pizza, uh, pizza recipe either. Just it was fine. It was a masterpiece. Do it exactly. Um, and then Wolf Ten Media makes a really good point. They act as if there are no limits. Well, you know, if we if we live by that, that's just that's just chaos ensued. Mm -hmm. And you'll you'll. Go I'm sorry. Ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, finish. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I think I was. I think it was finished, but <laughs> fill it, filling out sounds, I, I don't know. <laughs> you, you'll, you'll appreciate this analogy, this, uh, this metaphor here. You'll appreciate this quite a bit. I think it's like, if you just, you have an onion I and was you just so start to peel it away. <laughs> I, I, I was thinking, I, I had, we had gone for an hour and 50 minutes before I realized oh, I'm not talking about onions. <laughs> see, see, Big Al, it's not us. It's not you and me. He, he, he <laughs> secretly obsessed with onions. Let's go all. He's got this. He's got this. Um, I'm sorry. Do you actually have uh, an analogy? I, I, it's, it's just on the surface. You keep peeling something away, it'll, it'll be all gone, and there's nothing more to peel away. But uh, but my that was my secret obsession with onions. Talking apparently. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could have done a, a tapestry with a thread. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I was I was so rooting for this this uh, stream to be pure without any. <laughs> I did have onions today too, and and it might not make you feel so good that I I can listen to your commentary and still with a peace of mind chop onions for for my dinner. Uh, well, it just means I need to try harder in my commentary. <laughs> yeah, I, I was I didn't mean to interrupt your your. No, no, that was it. I was, it was the joke of bringing it up. <laughs> that was all. That's right. Well, uh, you want to wrap things up? Or I'll wrap things up. So <laughs> I know it's my channel. It's kind of weird. <laughs> this is your first time on my channel. so it's It is. It is. Yeah. Um, uh, so always Monday nights around 9, 30, 10 p.m. Eastern, uh, Monday nights. Uh, commentary on usually music, art, or or the like, or just, just general topics about art or um, artists. And yes, yes, why, why don't we just bring a full circle? French onions. <laughs> mm. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think I 
sorry, I was, uh, uh, yeah, anyway, I was, just, <laughs> I was on a roll and then I got distracted. <laughs> um, you were on Mondays. Mondays. Yeah, so Monday nights, of course, here on the Sound Engraver channel. Um, I think I think next week I'll, I'll just go light, more general topic on just being an artist in, in these hard times and what to do, what to expect, because um, I, I do think, especially into the end of 2020 and getting into 2021, I just have a feeling we might be in it for the long haul whatever mm -hmm. form that may be. So I think we'll talk more about um, uh, art and, and just con continuing producing art as well. Um, and actually real quick before I go on to other stuff in the week, I did want to say that um, what you do bring a solution on your channel to, to all this uh, mistreatment of these beloved stories. The first is, as I've heard you say on your videos, preserving and reading what has come before and, and looking mm -hmm. at what has come before and honoring and, and always mentioning and just enjoying it as as a reader, a, a viewer, or whatever the case may be. And then the second is, uh, which you've also been providing on your channel, is do your own art. You know, mm -hmm. don't don't. I would say for artists, and I know this might come across maybe a little uh, not too harsh. I hope not too harsh on on to the audience. Yeah, it, it's one thing we we can be sad what's happened to our beloved stories. I think it's worth. The discussion it's worth being addressed and it's worth being talked about and 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 seeing the cultural and social ramifications of these of these gross gross um mistreatments of our stories but our artists who do produce art and this is why i always end it with produce the art you love is that that's what you have to do you know honor the old and then use that as an impetus for your your own art because that that's what those people did before you with yeah. with, with great names before them and so it's it just it's honoring actually kind of an overall legacy, and mm -hmm. and so continue continue the legacy of these writers and these filmmakers and these these authors by modeling after them and doing what they did. So that those are the two solutions: is preserve what has come before and honor what has come before by by doing your own thing. Well now, said. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um. Oh yeah. Yeah, we'll definitely plug in some stuff. Um, so Tuesday, Tuesday. Uh, on Professor Geek's channel, you want to take it away? Yeah, Tuesday Night Noir. We're still doing that Tuesday nights. And we, uh, we're we jumping forward a little bit tomorrow with Kiss Me Deadly to the 50s. So a little bit more of a, maybe a little bit more of a harder edge, kind of atomic world, you know, in the 50s. But uh, then the next week, we're going to bounce back into some classic uh, 40 stuff with Out of the Past with Robert Mitchum and Jane Greer. So uh, lots to come with the Tuesday Night Noir. That's still fun. That's Tuesday. Okay, so the, the 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 following weeks are noir as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, next cool. two weeks are noir as well. Yeah, sticking cool. with it for a while. People seem to enjoy it. So good, good. All right, and anything happening for Wednesday? I'm not sure, but of course, so. Man and his second cup cafes usually ballparking Tuesdays and Thursdays, eleven Eastern time. He usually mm -hmm. does it around eleven Eastern time, 10, 10 p.m. Central or ten a.m. Sorry, a.m. Central. Mm -hmm. I remember when I first saw saw those, and I thought it was a, a time conflict with one of your. I was like, "Wait, you can't do 10 p.m. The props do." <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, that's going to cause a conflict. <laughs> oh, uh oh, drama. No. <laughs> yeah. Um, Thursday nights is Thursday nights. We're still doing the book study for Star Wars Scoundrels. Al is not here to remind me of the numbers. I Chapters think it's nine, nine to 10, 11, 12. 12. Yeah, not yeah, because we're doing four at a time. So this right. is our third installment, Star Wars Scoundrels by Timothy Zahn, following Han, Chewie, and Lando on a really cool heist story. So um, you can catch up. You can catch up. I mean, the videos are on the channel, so you can still catch up the first ones if you missed them. But that's fun. Yeah, we're going to continue the book study Thursday. So Yeah, very good. Very good. Um, and Friday, probably something fan man. Something fan man, probably Friday. Yeah, usually but is. Saturday. Saturday is going to be sweet. Yes. Uh, yes, yes. Presents channel and it looks like Troy has it on the link. Um, is and thanks, thanks for doing that, Troy. Um, Forbidden Planet. Yes, I've only seen it once, but what I did see, I absolutely loved, and I'm so fine with seeing it again. Yes, it's yes. Dearly beloved sci-fi film. Absolutely. Is it right on 1950 or just in that decade? I can't remember. I don't know the exact year. I don't know. I'd have to look that up. Good. Wonderful. Uh, What's the right term? Is it concept art or conceptual? I think it's concept art. No, I think I got that confused for many years. 
Someone's not here. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But uh, but no, it is a good movie. It's a good one that, that uh, shows the, the the depth that you can bring classic stories and classic narratives th through science fiction. So classic yeah. themes. Good job. Some social and psychological science there too. Mm -hmm. um, also, Mr. Matchstick has your you have your we watch right, Mr. Matchstick, on your channel. Uh, Cowboy Sunday. This Sunday. Yeah. But actually, if you can confirm the time, I'm not sure what time it is. I just know it's Sunday. So I'll let you do that. And as you post that, Mr. Matchstick, if you're still there. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I think you guys, I, I know you guys are some, some, some of you are artists, um, illustrators, mm -hmm. writers. Uh, wait, not you, but that's important too. <laughs> <laughs> not you, Troy. Get yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel Craig says, I really need to actually learn all these production tools I've purchased, downloaded, but never finished anything with. And I think that that will come for sure as, as far as my content, that the, the ability and the art of practicing and how to practice practicing and, and, and finishing it. And especially in this year, it's such a confusing year. It's easy to get so scattered, but um, that's definitely coming. I, so I think next next week we'll talk about just what we can do as artists in, in these mm -hmm. times and, and some practical solutions and applications. And you guys, you guys on the chat next week, tell me what you guys do specifically. And maybe I can kind of gauge how I do it as a musician as, and as a composer as well. Nice. 19, ah, 19, it's not posting. Okay. Do you guys see Al's uh, comment? I don't know why it's not posting, but no, it's weird. I think my mouse might be stuck. I don't know. I hope I can get off. <laughs> oh, whew. okay. Um, 10 p.m. Eastern for Mr. Matchstick. And I I can't right click, guys. <laughs> so I might have to do this the hard stop way. <laughs> um, so hopefully I can end this broadcast. Um, but in any case, I think that's everything. Okay, that was there it. There it goes. It pops up. That was an eight second delayed reaction. Must be StreamYard. <laughs> I hope so. That makes you nervous. <laughs> Yeah, so I think that's everything for uh, this coming week. We have mm -hmm. much everything. You guys, got to take up uh, Wednesday nights. Netter's network. That's that should be your Wednesday nights. That's so. right, Netter. Yeah. Go for it. Take take the win. Take them Wednesdays. <laughs> so. Anyway, guys. Well, I think I think that's it for me. Thank you, Professor Geek, for coming on. It's just been a thrill talking about this stuff with you. Thank and, you. It's been an honor. Yeah, and so. Um, always be on the lookout for some sound experimentation every Thursday and some live commentary on art and music every Monday nights. And until I see you next, keep producing the art you love and we will catch you later. Take care. <laughs>